Okay, this works. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I guess that the connection works, that everybody's online and admitted to the conference. Uh, I'm happy and pleased to see again so many participants, this time even a few uh, scholars and friends here in the room, uh, which is uh, obviously an exciting moment uh, on the reopening of uh, the campus of the EUI after the summer break. Uh, we see indeed more and more seminars, conferences, workshops with uh, in-presence participants and not only online. I think the hybrid model is certainly uh, a one that we can all accept and uh, with pleasure. So I would like first to thank the organizers, uh, Amedeo Arena, uh, Mario Pagano and uh, Virginia Pasalacqua for this uh, conference um, at the Villa Salviati. And uh, in fact, if I think back a couple of years ago, uh, hosting such a conference at the Historical Archives of the European Union, of the European Union which I'm heading, would have been uh, quite impossible. Uh, and only with the arrival of the Court of Justice archives, uh, our archives has become a, a player in the uh, history of European law. So uh, a topic like the mobilization of European law um, hosted by the Historical Archives of the European Union has now become almost a mainstream um, uh, a seminar, type of seminar that we host. And in fact, we, uh, we are very pleased about this development and the fact that the uh, Court of Justice of the EU back in 2014 decided to deposit their historical archives and to open them to the public. Uh, although we know that many sources uh, have been accessible uh, in other places on the rulings of the court and uh, on, uh, let's say, all the contextual information. Um, but obviously, it has been an important uh, step taken by the Court of Justice to acknowledge the existence of their own historical archives, which until then uh, was not the case. And also that the court itself has become an, uh, a more active, uh, even to, to say an actor, in its own history. Uh, now, law, it's difficult for lawyers sometimes to accept the fact that uh, law is political, uh, but we see it uh, these days again. Um, I don't think that it's uh, by uh, accident that the, uh, the head of the German Constitutional Court, uh, Mr. Voskuhle, uh, did the ruling on almost the very last day of his office, uh, uh, claiming uh, the problematic um, sphere of primacy. And uh, I'm not sure whether he was aware that the Polish government would pick up that ruling exactly a few days later and use it for its own very different political purposes. So we see today that uh, law is political. And um, then it depends on uh, your pro or non uh, or uh, pro European or Eurosceptic uh, stance, how to use this. But obviously, we today will look back into, let's say, more positive pro European times when uh, there was obviously a political will for integration and uh, for the establishment of uh, something that is called the European law, which uh, if we look at the treaties is a very weak subject. And only through the uh, rulings of the court, it became basically delineated uh, and uh, became a real body of law as we know it today in the last uh, 70 years, uh, thousands of rulings from the court that made European law in some way. So I'm very pleased to have this conference today, the mobilization of EU law uh, with all its different actors, uh, all the diversities, um, and um, to see also all these uh, participants. And uh, with this, I'm happy to uh, welcome all the participants and the speakers. Thank everybody already for their participation and pass the word to Amedeo, who will give us a short introduction into the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dieter. <clears throat> so let me also thank uh, the De Gasperi Center for hosting uh, this event in this wonderful setting. So really glad to be here uh, with some of you in person and so many of you online. Um, so uh, let me introduce the conference by um, mentioning, uh, by quoting Mario Lozano's introduction to uh, the Italian edition of Hans Kelsen, The Problem of Justice. Uh, on that occasion, Mario Lozano criticized Kelsen pure theory of law by comparing the law to an egg and asking the following question. How can we account for the origin, the structure, 
or, I beg your pardon, the shape of the egg if we disregard the hen. For this reason, reference to preparatory work, to drafting history is a canon of interpretation in international treaties and domestic legislation. And social scientists have devoted considerable attention to lawmaking and treaty making as a process, as a series of steps in which different actors play different roles. Uh, now that we think about it, also court rulings are one of a series of steps known as process, characterized by a variety of actors. Indeed, as uh, Gallanter put it in, uh, in 1981, courts do not acquire cases of their own motion, but they uh, only, um, uh, only upon the initiative of one of the disputants. And as Zemans put it in 1983, courts are reactive institutions. This means that individual litigants can actually set the agenda of the judicial branch of the government. This is the essential intuition underlying legal mobilization, the strategic use of litigation to promote political or societal change. By looking at who, how, why uh, uh, institutes launches legal proceedings, a legal mobilization studies seek to provide a better understanding of the outcome of the judicial process, that is to say, court rulings. This aspect is arguably essential in the field of European integration, where the court of justice and national courts have played and still play a very important role in advancing the integration process, despite um, political deadlocks, according to the famous integration through law theory. A growing body of scholarship indeed suggests that also other actors play a role, such as uh, lawyers and private parties in the process of European integration. This is why uh, Virginia, Mario and I have set up this conference to gather together a number of different insights on the mobilization of EU law. The conference will consist of three panels, uh, focusing respectively on the origins, the developments, and the perspective of legal mobilization. The first panel will focus on how the preliminary ruling procedure has become the weapon of choice in the arsenal of those wishing to invoke EU law to bring about systemic change. Notably, Karen Van Leeuwen will focus on the earliest preliminary references Bosch and Van Gendelos against the background of the peculiar Dutch context, while I will outline how Costa Vienna has transformed the preliminary ruling procedure into an infringement procedure available to citizens of all member states. Legal historian Morten Rasmussen will serve as discussant. Tuned on the second panel, it will focus on the evolution of legal mobilization and will enrich our account by focusing on one of the main players, that is to say, lawyers. Um, they play a key role in legal mobilization before the ACJ, uh, as they are, the, they are the one who understand the potential of EU law and of the preliminary re reference procedure. They decide whether to use it as a sword or a shield, depending on their clients' interests and opportunity of the day. In particular, Lola Vril uh, will um, uh, focus on the role of EU lawyers in the development of competition law. And then Tom Pavone will address the evolution of Euro lawyering and corporatization of EU law litigation. And Lamine Qatar will focus instead of pro bono in the EU and beyond. Antoine Boucher will serve as discussant. The third and final panel will examine a new term in the legal mobilization actors. In the last decade, the EU entered into new political domains such as migration and environmental protection. This has attracted new actors and transformed heavily the type of individuals that arrive in Luxembourg, NGOs, migrants, social movements, legal aid firms, etc. New political issues and struggles are brought before the ECJ, which became more politicized than ever. These issues will be examined by Virginia Vassalacqua, who will focus on legal mobilization via the preliminary reference procedure as a tool to promote migrant rights, and Mario Pagano, who will focus on how environmental NGOs employ the preliminary ruling procedure and litigation before the ECJ um, to affect EU climate policy. Lisa Conant and Luca Prete will serve as discussants. Finally, Alberto Alemanno, academic, author, public interest lawyer, and civic entrepreneur will present the conclusion to this panel. So without any further ado, I think I should hand over to the chair of the first panel, Mario, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Amedeo. Thank you also, Dieter, and welcome everyone to, this, to the first session of the first panel that I have the honor to chair today. Um, this first panel on the origins of legal mobilization of, of EU law. Um, as Amedeo already uh, mentioned, uh, we're going to have two speakers and one discussant. So I'm going to leave the floor very soon to, I hope I'm going to pronounce her name correctly. And I hope that she's going to correct me if I mis misspell it. Karin van Leuven um, from Maastricht University. Welcome, Karin. 
Uh, Karin is assistant professor in European uh, political history uh, in the history department of the University of Maastricht and postdoc at the University of Copenhagen in the Saxo um, Institute. Uh, her research focuses on the intersections of political and legal history, whether at, on a national, constitutional, European, or international level. Welcome, Karin, and you have the floor. Um, sorry, I'm going to, well, of course, I'm, I forgot to mention the, the, the name of the title of the, of, of, uh, of the presentation of Karin. Paving the Road to Legal Revolution, the Making of the Bosch, 1962, and Van Hendel Law's 1963 Preliminary Rulings. Welcome, Karin. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, many thanks uh, to the organizers for um, uh, well, inviting me to, to share um, my uh, paper here. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't be present uh, in person in, in Florence. It would have been really nice, I guess, uh, to, to join you, but I'm indeed with Dieter very glad that now at least we have this um, hybrid uh, model to continue with uh, conferences as we'd like to, uh, to see them. Um, so I will do my best to uh, well, present uh, as well as uh, if, uh, if I would have been there. Um, so thanks also um, for this uh, welcoming words. Uh, indeed, um, uh, I work in uh, Maastricht University. I have worked also in Copenhagen, unfortunately not uh, formally anymore, but uh, co cooperation continues, I can assure you. Um, what I will discuss today, uh, as mentioned indeed, is some historical cases of legal mobilization on which I worked and published actually uh, some years ago. Um, these first cases that uh, reached uh, the Court of Justice as pre preliminary uh, references, which are indeed the Bosch and Van Gent and Loos, um, cases. Um, as you already mentioned, my background is in, in political uh, and legal history, in particular Dutch history, and this is also how I looked at these cases, trying to refine existing explanations for the emergence of these cases um, through in-depth uh, archival research. Uh, and for today, um, I haven't done really a lot of new work, but what I've tried to do is look at these cases through this layer of mobilization of uh, European law. And just for those who are uh, trying to figure what is on these um, uh, slides, um, actually, this is uh, where uh, the court was uh, housed, so the European Court of Justice, uh, before they uh, moved to the Kirchberg. Uh, so quite a um, nondescript office building uh, at the heart of Luxembourg. Um, OK. So. Um, as I uh, already said, I will do my best to tune into this literature on uh, legal mobilization uh, and present my case as a historical case study in this uh, uh, mobilization. And uh, with Conant and, and, and co-authors, uh, I define this as, as a broad uh, uh, literature on the question why individuals, groups, and companies actually go to court. So indeed, this question that comes before um, the focus on what courts do, uh, we actually need to know why uh, or how they actually, uh, yeah, how these court uh, cases actually reach them. Um, as said, I build on a paper that I published a couple of years ago in the European um, uh, Law Journal, um, uh, where I uh, yeah, framed this as uh, explaining the road to uh, legal revolution, which I, of course, cautiously uh, put in brackets, and I'm not going to elaborate on that now. Um, uh, but yeah, the focus was on these uh, two cases. Um, and um, uh, indeed, what I wanted to do is look really from the bottom. Why did these cases emerge in the first place? Um, so uh, looking beyond also the doctrinal and um, uh, uh, revolutionary impact of the cases, but rather to the origins. And uh, for me as a historian, of course, that means that I uh, look very much uh, at this process as some complex process, contingent process, so not defined by one or two factors only. And um, what is very important, I think, uh, and that is for me just um, finding out by doing, is that it uh, uh, also means that uh, uh, the uh, role of unsuccessful cases is quite important, as well as political context and also micro histories of individual actors and indeed as Dieter said that uh, can uh, take uh, uh, quite far by going also beyond what is in the court archives and looking into national archives etc. 
Um, well, as mentioned, um, uh, um, um, my historical research aimed to refine uh, existing accounts of, of course, these preliminary references as they were, uh, their impact is uh, uh, so uh, uh, important. Uh, there were already a lot of uh, studies uh, done uh, also on the emergence of these cases. But what I found is that they, these typically focused uh, quite a bit on uh, the doctrinal um, uh, uh, developments uh, and also uh, those developments preceding the cases. So what you see is that the role of um, national law, national legal context is very much uh, emphasized. Um, and I will uh, um, uh, talk a little bit more about that in a second, but uh, what is very important here is this particular Dutch context with its openness uh, towards the international legal order. Um, other elements that were highlighted, of course, Martin Rasmussen has done some uh, work here uh, uh, focused on the European Commission's legal service, uh, which was quite crucial in the emergence of these cases, as well as broader transnational networks of um, yeah, Euro uh, lawyers, as they have been called by uh, Antoine Vaucher. Um, but what we see here is, again, is very much this focus on doctrine uh, and uh, that uh, element of those cases. But what I want to argue here, and what I probably uh, will also find uh, repeated elsewhere, is this, this is, of course, not just a story of doctrine. Um, uh, what I will argue is that these cases that happened to end up in, uh, in Luxembourg were not uh, filed as test cases, but that they were actually also very much focused on the uh, substance, uh, on a particular substance that we can only understand in the context of uh, the debate about those particular uh, uh, topics. So we need to bring in those stories as well. Uh, and that requires uh, a multi-archival and chronological approach, um, also following not just the mobilization of uh, European law, but maybe also unsuccessful uh, attempts uh, to mobilize that law. Now, um, this can be uh, and has already developed into a quite complex story. So trying uh, to um, yeah, present this in not uh, too much time, um, I uh, split it up in, let's say, three layers of uh, what well, you could say uh, the pavement uh, uh, that, that uh, well, I uh, metaphorically uh, used, of course, in the title of this paper. Um, so the layers that I will um, discuss First is uh, the doctrinal layer, because as I said, I'm not saying that it didn't play a role, but I think it's just uh, one aspect of it. Uh, so I will look into that first. Uh, then uh, look into the emergence of uh, the Bosch case in particular, which is, uh, needs to be understood from a context of uh, debates about competition and competition law. And finally, uh, we look into the Vergent case and its particular context um, as uh, a, a, a debate about import uh, tariffs. Um, so let's say uh, first uh, this uh, base layer about uh, which focuses very much on um, these doctrinal uh, developments. And of course, these were very much conditional for the other developments to, to actually take place. And here we see that we're looking both at uh, what Conant uh, and, and, and other authors have called the systemic macro level uh, developments, but also very much the national, um, so meso level uh, factors. Um, of course, um, the most important, let's say, European level uh, 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 factor or condition here is um, the um, concluding of the uh, EEC treaty the role of the European Court of Justice in that, and particularly, of course, what is new here, uh, this new Article 177 about preliminary references, which is in the treaty, but um, uh, as um, others have uh, uh, pointed out, leads uh, in the first years uh, to quite some, well, uh, confusion or at least debate about how exactly those uh, should be, oper or that article should be operationalized. Um, so um, uh, that's, let's say, maybe the most important uh, uh, background. Then if we look at the national level, and I already said that the Dutch uh, situation is, is quite peculiar here, um, we have the background of 
a mid 1950s uh, constitutional reform, or actually an amalgamate of, of two reforms uh, that um, uh, openly acknowledge the primacy of international uh, law, or at least those international legal provisions which, uh, in the terms of the Dutch constitution, are considered binding on anyone. Uh, it is kind of a translation of self-executing. It's not precisely that, but let's not uh, go too much into that uh, here. Um, now, um, that could be uh, quite um, uh, crucial, but what we see in practice is that Dutch courts, well, already for a longer time, acknowledge this, this monist uh, approach to, to international law, but at the same time, uh, use it in a very reticent way. Um, as they do basically with, with all um, uh, uh, their um, uh, cases about national uh, uh, legislation, because uh, next to this very kind of revolutionary uh, constitutional clauses, which are actually also uh, observed in international press, um, there is the Dutch constitution also has a ban on judicial review, which means that uh, um, legislation uh, cannot be a challenge and it, it goes together with a very strong primacy on uh, parliamentary uh, politics and a uh, very conciliatory style of doing politics. So there is this, let's say, contradictory situation in, in, uh, as, as the Dutch approach to uh, uh, um, uh, the role of the courts is, is regarded. Now, let's say as a last but not least, uh, part of the, let's say, more doctrinal considerations or contexts here, we have uh, the role of uh, some of, um, uh, very prominent um, pioneers of European law, um, part of which, whom a uh, group uh, around uh, the uh, Europa Institute uh, in the University of Leiden um, uh, established in, the, in 1960, um, around uh, the Dutch branch of FIDE, uh, so the uh, uh, National uh, European Law Association, but also around the journal uh, Social Economische Wetgeving, which is already from the early 1950s commenting on uh, European law and also very much promoting, or at least many of its contributors are promoting a, let's say, constitutionalist uh, view of European law. Um, so those, this is, let's, be, let's say, the, the, the base layer, the, the context uh, of this uh, uh, the later developments. Now, if we then move to the, let's say, more uh, substantial um, uh, matters of, of the court cases, we first had to look into uh, especially the uh, competition um, uh, clauses in the EEC treaty um, and um, uh, its relation to uh, Dutch law. Um, for as, um, well, actually one of the key players uh, in, in uh, later academic debate, uh, Sam Calden, Ivo Sam Calden, uh, finds out already in, in 1957 when he's still Minister of Justice, um, there is an uneasy relation between the Dutch law on competition and the new um, uh, EEC treaty clauses. I wrote down Article 85, but it's actually also 86, uh, with regards to competition agreements. Uh, European law and Dutch law are basically incompatible here, and with the new constitutional clauses, this, this means that the Dutch um, rather um, uh, accommodating policies towards competition agreements may actually be challenged in court. Um, now, this is, let's say, again, maybe the macro and, and meso uh, uh, stories here. What are more the micro elements of this story? Um, are that there is actually already a, quite an active jurisprudence in the 1950s on the violation of distribution agreements. Um, there is a, a wide discussion about a so-called radio cartel, um, which is, let's say, keeping the prices of radios, but actually also other electronic equipment quite high. Um, and uh, there is parallel import of such electronic equipment. Um, and of course, that is again challenged by uh, the, the, the companies involved in the uh, cartels or in the distribution agreements. So there is already this, this active or the, this practice and also this active the jurisprudence on this. 
And from this jurisprudence already quite early on, so in the late 1950s, come a couple of cases which indeed bring in the possibility of, um, well, uh, bring in European law, uh, the new treaty clauses, but also the possibility of um, uh, using the preliminary reference mechanism uh, for establishing these, uh, 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 these legal rights. Um, those are initially a couple of cases get rejected by courts on procedural grounds uh, mainly. And then um, in um, um, 1961, there is a breakthrough when a Hague, the Hague Appeal Court uh, 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 decides to actually use the preliminary reference mechanism in uh, the case of uh, Bosch. Um, now, I just mentioned this Hague Court, Rotterdam Lawyer, etc., uh, to highlight that even though later on, when the court, uh, the case gets uh, to Luxembourg, um, a couple of e uh, European law specialists uh, joined uh, the case, initially those were really the, the lawyers that had worked on these earlier um, uh, court cases, and certainly no uh, specialists or pioneers in this European law um, uh, movement. Um, now, um, uh, this was an important development, especially, of course, for European law, but what is more important in the Dutch context, actually, is not um, the, the ruling of um, uh, the European Court of Justice in 1962, but rather a uh, ruling of the uh, Dutch Supreme Court, the Hoge Raad, which also confirmed, um, and this went against uh, the earlier uh, statements uh, made by its Advocate General, uh, in 1962, it actually confirmed um, the use of the preliminary reference in this case, in these kind of cases, uh, to establish uh, the intentions of the uh, of the EEC treaty. Um, so uh, this was, uh, in a way, the approval of the use uh, of the preliminary reference mechanism in the Dutch uh, context. Now, when I go quite fast uh, uh, through uh, uh, quite a lot of matter, I, I realize that. Um, moving to the top layer, uh, so to say, of um, these um, uh, Dutch um, uh, developments. Uh, again, of course, we need to start with, let's say, the macro and, and meso level story. So um, the EEC treaty, uh, the relevant clauses, uh, which in this case are uh, is uh, particularly the provision on uh, tariffs, Article 12, uh, and um, what we see at the same time, of course, where Article 12 uh, prohibits uh, raising uh, tariffs um, after the conclusion of the EEC treaty. Uh, at the same time, there is the development in the Netherlands, or rather in the Benelux, of a new um, system uh, for tariffs, the Brussels nomenclature, uh, which is uh, uh, eventually uh, issued in 1960. Um, and obviously, um, there are some um, uh, clashes here. Um, uh, this is almost inevitably. Um, but what we see usually in, in uh, the whole discussion um, uh, uh, and parliamentary debates uh, upon the introduction of these, um, uh, this new legislation is that these uh, normally are settled uh, out of court and, uh, and, and with, with uh, compromises. And we even see that uh, in 1962, when a court case is started, um, uh, the meat trading case, uh, about uh, the interpretation of Article 12, uh, and where there's also uh, talk about uh, yeah, making uh, this case into a preliminary reference, this is actually withdrawn and settled out of court because that was more convenient to the, uh, to the parties. Um, and and um, at the same time, um, uh, so we see that quite a number of cases are filed with the Tarif Commissie, uh, so uh, the court uh, in the Netherlands and the kind of an administrative court uh, uh, responsible for tariff matters. Um, and uh, there's one particularly uh, particular tax lawyer, Piet Droog, who files a lot of those cases, but often he gets just zero on his request. I mean, it seems also quite far off that he, he brings in the EC treaty. Um, and what we see there is that the Tarif Committee, a committee which is an administrative court, is very much um, not just uh, uh, ruling only on whether it, the law is, is violated, but rather also looking into whether this was an act of bad faith. Uh, and, and this is why they don't really want to go with Droog, 
in, in many of his claims. However, there is a difference when it uh, comes to this case uh, on hand and loads. Uh, and this has to do with the, the substance of the case, which is uh, this, uh, uh, actual, an actual substance, a harmful part, a particular uh, substance, a glue used, to, for example, to, to make wooden doors in this particular context. Um, and there has been already throughout the 1950s an ongoing dispute between um, uh, importers and the government, but also with the Talib uh, uh, Committee involved about the actual definition of this substance. Is it a liquid? Is it a, 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 a um, non-liquid substance? Uh, that's, that's the ongoing dispute. And what we see is that in this dis discussion, the um, advice of the Tarif Committee had actually been ignored. So um, uh, this was actually something, of course, that this particular lawyer <laughs> knew very well and um, that he brought up in, in the context, especially when um, uh, this um, uh, uh, Hoge Raad um, uh, uh, ruling uh, became available in May 1962. Um, Droog really used that one, allowing preliminary references from Dutch court to uh, Luxembourg, but also he used this problem about this particular substance in which, well, he said there really was a matter of an act of bad faith, but also, yeah, there was no other way for this particular citizen or company to get their right uh, done justice. Uh, and this is how he phrased the case. And this is also how this particular case, um, well, uh, became uh, the case that was in fact uh, referred uh, to um, the European Court of Justice. Now we see that in the background of this micro story, there is a lot of work ongoing of, uh, let's say, the, the um, uh, lawyers uh, in, in, in Leiden and around Leiden working on uh, anyone binding or a direct effect of 3D clauses, working particularly on Article 12. But there's no direct involvement of them in this particular uh, case. So this really developed rather from uh, the substance of the case, but of course benefited a lot from the debate and the, the literature uh, uh, being published on this case, uh, on, on that, that uh, article more broadly. Okay, to conclude, uh, as I said in the beginning, I think a more refined account of these kind of cases is necessary also to reconsider the impact of these cases. And in this particular case, of course, I don't want to uh, contest that the, mo the major impact of the these cases was on doctrinal developments and on activating the preliminary reference mechanism and um, uh, confirming direct effects of European law. At the same time, um, uh, I think there was also this broader domestic impact of these cases on the way in which uh, European policies uh, were dealt with. So it's not enough anymore to come to some kind of rough political compromises, but actually companies start claiming rights based on EU law or European law this time uh, that could lead to challenging a legislation in court. So I think this is also very much part of the story and a part that this focus through legal mobilization um, really makes uh, visible. And then there's of course still some work uh, that needs to uh, uh, be done to make that um, even better visible to understand that better, also to look at the longer uh, terms. Uh, let's conclude with uh, this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. Thanks a lot for explaining to us not only the history behind Bosch and Van Gendelos, but also the political implications of these cases, of these landmark, landmarking cases uh, of the ECJ. And now we move to the the, the person who actually gave the introductory speech. So we go back to Amedeo. It is going to talk to us about another, another extremely famous uh, case of the, in, the, in, the, in the history of European legal integration that is uh, Costa Enel. But first, let me introduce you who Amedeo Arena is, professor of EU law and EU law in action at Università Federico II in Naples in the beautiful city of Naples. Currently visiting fellow at the Alcide de Gasperi Research Center here at DUI. 
and his, his most recent, recent publications concerned the early stages of the European integration. He authored an article on the history of Costa Enel that has been endorsed by the historical archives of the EUI, of the EU and at the EUI, and translated into eight languages. He's currently editing a book on the European coal and steel community and is coordinating a research project on the origins, developments, and perspectives of, on, the, on the mobilization of EU law. Thank you, Amedeo. You have the floor. All right. Thank you very much, Mario, for your kind introduction. So the starting point of my story today is, of course, Van Gendel Los. Um, because um, everybody, uh, or at least many um, scholars, many community law scholars in Italy, were wondering um, if something like that could be replicated in Italy. So what if Van Gendel Los were Italian? Well, uh, we have one very interesting opinion on, on this point uh, that is by Nicola Catalano, who uh, just, uh, he was uh, judge of the um, Court of Justice uh, just until 1962. And his opinion uh, was the following, that if something like that had happened in Italy, so there were like a, 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 an act of parliament that would contradict the treaties and an act of parliament that would be adopted after the treaties, then, um, and the conflict, um, would be uh, subject to a case before an Italian court, that court would have no need to uh, request the Court of Justice uh, to provide an interpretation of the provisions of the treaty because that court would have no jurisdiction to resolve the conflict between, between those rules. So uh, why is that? Can we, again, can we argue that Catalano was against community primacy? Well, not really. Or that he was not familiar with the preliminary ruling procedure? Again, not really. Apparently, he was the one who invented that, at least according to Pescatore's account of the, uh, of the, uh, of the travel preparatoire of the Treaty of Rome. And uh, it, it seems, at uh, least in my in opinion, is that um, uh, it was just a kind of mindset. So uh, the idea is that certain issues, such as the hierarchy and the effects of community law in domestic legal orders, well, were still uh, issues of, of constitutional law, a, a, issue, a, a, a point of view also shared by, by Lagrange in, in his famous opinion in, in Costa. But uh, it seems interesting that Catalano was also trying to pursue primacy in another way. Indeed, when the FIDE uh, conference in October 1963 adopted a resolution on, uh, on, on internal primacy of community law. It seems quite clear to me, it's absolutely necessary that pre the primacy of community uh, rules on, uh, on internal rules, even adopted afterwards, be respected in all member states. He noted that uh, this resolution was drafted in a way to leave the door open to lawyers, which would find a way to uh, bring a case before the Court of Justice. And that lawyer, of course, would be Gian Galeazzo Stendardi. Uh, Gian Galeazzo Stendardi was uh, a lawyer at the Milan Bar, um, a lecturer of constitutional law at the University of Milan. Um, uh, he was a monarchist sympathizer, even uh, he was a candidate for the monarchy, for, 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 for the Italian monarchist party. And uh, um, he was extremely concerned about Italy's uh, representative democracy. In his 1955 uh, book on political parties, he essentially <clears throat> argued that uh, um, uh, Italian political representative democracy was broken because uh, political parties and were too strong and uh, elected officials were in fact accountable to, to party leaderships, not to the electors. And uh, um, the solution to that was what uh, Antoine Vaucher brilliantly called uh, an activist conception of the rule of law, uh, which is clearly uh, um, uh, outlined in his 1967 book on uh, the role of the individual in the community legal order. So uh, drawing clear inspiration from uh, Rudolf Foyering, uh, The Struggle for Law, he argues that the best keeper and defender of the, um, of the legal order, the community legal order, and any, uh, any legal order really, is the individual, when his or her rights and expectations are undermined. So uh, he also uh, made another interesting consideration. It is the Court of Justice that through uh, its uh, interpretation activity uh, creates the community legal order and fleshes out the provisions uh, uh, set out in the treaty, thus giving uh, the community an actual content. Now the impulse, the, um, the trigger 
for this activity is indeed entrusted to the individual. And uh, he also uh, provocatively encouraged uh, everyone, um, to um, every community citizen, to ask themselves, what have we done? What are we doing to make sure that community law develops and that it is actually applied in the member states? Uh, so he devised a number of ways uh, that would enable individuals um, to, um, to essentially seek judicial review of uh, national rules that would be inconsistent with community law. There are a number of them, but I will only focus on three of them. The centralized judicial review model, whereby um, an Italian court would bring a case before the Italian constitutional court, which could then uh, declare that uh, the Italian statute um, at variance with community law would be also contrary to it, uh, Article 11 of the Italian Constitution, which is Italy's uh, uh, kind of European clause, the one enabling the transfer of sovereignty to, uh, to the three communities. And of course, this is a centralized solution because it is only for the Italian Constitutional Court to review the constitutionality of Italian laws and, uh, uh, and to declare them unconstitutional with erga omnes effect. So these laws are completely uh, eliminated from the Italian legal order. Then there was another solution, uh, which we can call decentralized judicial review, whereby uh, it is for individual courts to submit a reference, preliminary reference to the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice would then establish whether a conflict exists between um, uh, community law and national law. And the case would then come back to uh, the national court, the Italian court, which would then set aside the conflicting national laws, national laws at variance with community law. As you can see, the constitutional court here is on the side, so it's a completely marginalized in this kind of model. And then he also devised um, a not so famous model, kind of uh, indirect judicial review model. So it would be for the person to um, essentially uh, ask the European um, Commission to um, assess, uh, to inform the European Commission of the national provision that would be inconsistent with the treaty and ask the European Commission to do something about that, to address the issue. And uh, probably uh, we, to be bring up the issue with the member state. If the commission fails to do so, then the person can bring an action for failure to act before the court of justice. The court of justice on that occasion would not only establish that the commission um, has failed to carry out its duties, but also, uh, so in incidentally, would also um, uh, establish the, the inconsistency between uh, the national uh, provision and community law. And it would then be for uh, Italian courts, trial courts, to uh, set aside that provision. Uh, now, let's see how the standardist theory were turned into practice. And of course, we need a motive for that. And standardist motive was opposing electricity nationalization. Now, to understand that, uh, of course, we uh, just have to uh, briefly uh, remind what happened in, Italy, in, in Italian politics between 1957 and 1962. So um, the main party, the Christian Democracy, centrist party, as you can see, uh, they are defending uh, the Italian motherland in the background with this big shield against communism. That was the kind of political climate of the time. In 1957, it was, a, it, it was on good terms with the Italian Liberal Party, which was a center-right party uh, that had a certain continuity with the Italian kingdom. So Standard was a kind of sympathizer of that party. However, uh, the political tide shifted significantly uh, with the change of the decade. We are at the height of Cold War here because the, uh, the, the, the Christian democracy um, decided to strike a uh, political compromise, uh, which then became an alliance with the Italian Socialist Party. And uh, the price for the Socialist Party support to the Christian democracy was, of course, the nationalization of electricity in Italy. And indeed, the Italian Liberal Party were, um, uh, were not happy about that. Uh, they uh, um, uh, pointed out that the socialists, for example, so um, that the socialists would not take, uh, give any promises as that that would be the last nationalization. So the fear uh, at that particular time was the, that this was the beginning of the transformation of Italy's economy into a planet economy. Uh, just by way of background, um, uh, a few months earlier, um, Soviet Union had detonated a 50 megaton nuke just to send the message that please do consider the carbon fit footprint before printing your emails. Okay, so uh, this was the kind of political setting at the time. Uh, so uh, when the um, uh, nationalization, the uh, nationalization started was uh, uh, published in the official journal, the stock market crashed, 
and uh, um, the shareholders of the companies affected by nationalization were demonstrating and some of them um, and, and standardly organized uh, meetings between those, those, those shareholders uh, to challenge the nationalization process. So this is kind of the background. So let's see how centralized the judicial review performed in this particular setting. Um, so this is where Flaminio Costa comes in. He was also a lawyer at the Milan bar, also a monarchist sympathizer. A few days after the nationalization um, started was approved, he purchased one share from Edison Volta one of the nationalized companies. And he also happened to be um, a user of Edison Volta. So um, and when he received his first electricity bill from Enel rather than from Edison Volta, as we know, he refused to pay it, claiming that uh, um, uh, Enel had not validly taken over his electricity contract with Edison Volta because the nationalization statute and all its implementing measures were in conflict with the Italian constitution and with the Treaty of Rome. Now, the case um, uh, was brought before the small claims court of Milan, namely Judge Carones heard the case, and he made a very important decision. He referred the matter only to the Italian Constitutional Court. Although Standardi also asked that the matter be referred to the Court of Justice, he only referred the matter to the Italian Constitutional Court, which therefore had the first mover advantage, had the first uh, say on the issue. And it's interesting to note how the Italian government um, addressed uh, the matter of primacy before the Italian Constitutional Court, uh, and, and in particular, our standard this argument that the annual statute being in conflict with the Treaty of Rome would also be in conflict with Article 11 of the Italian Constitution. In particular, the Italian government referred to the legal scholarship on the Treaty of Rome, uh, the Treaty of Rome, claiming that um, uh, the, essentially the treaty uh, were norms that were, did not, were, were devoid of a particular resistance from the constitutional point of view, and therefore they could be modified or even repealed by subsequent laws, such as the Enel Statute. And it's interesting here that the Italian government uh, cites Catalano uh, as supporting uh, legal scholarship. So we all know that the Italian Constitutional Court declared that uh, the Enel Statute was in line with the Constitution. So there was no constitutionality issues, no constitutional issue, which of course caused dismay in the community circles. We have a photo of the commission of the time, in particular, Michel Godet um, saw the consequences of that and emphasized the consequences of this ruling as, uh, as, uh, as undermining uh, the European community because it would create a permanent imbalance between member states which accepted primacy and member states which did not, such as Italy and probably Germany. However, Standardi had another ace up his sleeve. So as soon as he learned that the first uh, Judice Conciliatore, the first small claims court to Milan was unwilling to refer the case to Luxembourg, he launched other proceedings on behalf of Costa before another Judice Conciliatore in Milan. And I loved a quote from the genius paper. So for legal mobilization to be successful, you need the right case at the right moment and the right judge. And apparently this was the right judge. Uh, 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 um, Fabri was also um, a lawyer at the Milan bar and also a monarchist sympathizer. And in his uh, order of 16th of January, 1964, uh, he made an historical decision. He referred the case not only to Rome, again, for other constitutional reasons, so not only to the Italian Constitutional Court, but also to the Italian, uh, to, but also to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And this was the very first reference, very first reference for, uh, from, uh, from an Italian court. Uh, before the Court of Justice, Tendardi changed strategy and embraced the decentralized review model. He claimed that the reference should be regarded as admissible because it could be possible for national courts to set aside national laws that are incompatible with the provisions of the treaty. Um, Italy was represented by Riccardo Monaco, who would later that year become judge at the European Court of Justice. Uh, essentially, he claimed that the, um, uh, the referring court, the Giudice Conciliatore, uh, does not need to apply the, the, any provision of the Treaty of Rome, and therefore cannot have any doubt as to the interpretation of those provisions, because the, uh, the referring court only has to apply Italian law, the annual statute. Uh, for that reason, he claimed that the, that the reference should be declared absolutely inadmissible under Article 177 because the Court of Justice has no jurisdiction in that particular case. 
Well, it was really a no-brainer because that would probably make the code adjusts redundant. So it's unsurprising that in the famous Costa Vienna ruling of 1964, the Court of Justice addressed the issues as follows. Uh, the Court of Justice claimed the court has the power to extract from a question imperfectly formulated by national court those questions which alone pertain to the interpretation of the treaty, and that a decision could be given uh, not on the validity of an Italian law in relation to the treaty, but on the interpretation of the uh, articles of the Treaty of Rome that were invoked. And also the article 177 on, uh, on the preliminary procedure had to be applied regardless of any domestic law uh, whenever questions relating to the interpretation of the treaty arise. So it is important to point out that uh, primacy that was uh, enunciated in Costa Enel was the primacy of article 177, was the primacy of the preliminary ruling procedure. And that the inadmissibility and so, and that all the discussion on primacy essentially was triggered by this objection raised by the Italian government, as well as by the commission strategy to refer to the, to the judgment of the Italian Constitutional Court. What was the epilogue of that case? Well, Standardi was not too happy about the outcome of Costa Enel. He claimed that uh, that ruling showed the tendency to limit the case in which individual subjects can claim a violation of the treaty. That interpretation, again, Standardi noted, constitutes a, um, a dangerous turn for the community legal order. It is indeed the fundamental principle of the community that according to which the uh, protection of the legal order um, is, uh, um, is a, um, is, a, um, is possible thanks uh, to the action of individuals that are part of that legal order against this activist conception of the rule of law. Indeed, if we look at the operative part of Costa Enel, we see that two of the provisions of the treaty were declared to be devoid of direct effect, therefore of no use to rubber plaintiffs, and other two were interpreted in a rather narrow fashion. So the case came back to Judge Fabri, um, who instead uh, found that the Enel Statute would be in contrast, would be incompatible with two provisions of the Treaty of Rome. So he decided to set it aside and rule in favor of, uh, uh, rule in favor of, uh, of Flaminia Costa. But this apparently was not a persuasive solution. You see, it was reported by newspapers with a conditional form. It seems that the Enel Statute is unlawful. Uh, and indeed, uh, Enel, filed um, uh, an appeal before the Italian um, Supreme Court, which eventually um, struck, uh, pushed the ruling in 1970, claiming that the case essentially was moot because Flaminio Costa had no legal interest to bring proceeding and that the whole uh, proceeding was uh, an attempt to, um, to challenge the constitutionality of the annual statute, which is not allowed by Italian procedural rules. Possibly disappointed by the outcome uh, of, of Costa Enel, then Standard in 97 uh, tested this other, um, the, the, another, another enforcement mechanism, the indirect judicial review in the Chevalier and Borromeo cases. Against, uh, so, so essentially he claimed that uh, um, the, the individual could, uh, in order to, uh, to prompt, to trigger a judgment by the Court of Justice, could rely on the action for failure to act. So to uh, obtain indirectly what he or she could have obtained in a more direct and, 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 and fast and, 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 and less time consuming way. Uh, so uh, again, the trigger for um, this was uh, of political nature, because in 1969, uh, the Italian Senate uh, um, approved a bill on, on, on land rent. And uh, uh, again, the Liberal Party claimed that this was a de facto expropriation to landowners. And again, that it was the outcome of a political compromise between the Christian Democrats and the communists. Uh, so uh, Sandardi uh, sent a letter on behalf of uh, these landowners to the European Commission, asking for a decision, a decision that would, uh, uh, that would establish uh, that the uh, landowner, um, that uh, this bill would be in conflict with um, the, the, the Treaty of Rome, and also asking um, what conduct the landowners should follow, um, should follow when, um, when concluding these uh, this, this contracts, should the, the bill become law. Uh, the president of the commission himself replied to the letter and, he, and, and Jarre claimed that, uh, um, that uh, Mr. Chevalier was not entitled to any decision being taken in his respect. And also that the matter could not be brought before the court of justice with an action for failure to act. 
And this was confirmed by the Court of Justice because the Court of Justice found that essentially uh, the applicant was seeking uh, not a decision, but an opinion, which could not constitute the, um, the object of an action for failure to act. Uh, so it is unsurprising that uh, Sandardi was quite uh, disappointed by this outcome, which struck a fatal blow to his conception of the individual as the engine of European integration. So uh, how could he contribute to that if his uh, actions were declared inadmissible? However, uh, Standard can still be regarded as one of the fathers of legal mobilization of EU law. So in, uh, in this uh, in very influential paper by Lisa Conant and others, uh, so they outline uh, three levels uh, of analysis of legal mobilization, which I've seen that also Karin has employed in her, in her slides, in her paper. And I think what happened in Italy was quite interesting because um, uh, in, uh, in the Dutch case, in Van Gend, uh, so there was this kind of favorable meso level, so favorable constitutional uh, national setting. And then we have the action at the micro level of these lawyers. In Italy, it was a bit different. So we have a, a kind of, um, of meso level that was against this kind of proceedings. And uh, instead, a very strong activism on the part of Standard at the micro level. But the negative uh, meso level possibly constitutes the trigger for, uh, for the macro level. So uh, indeed, uh, since uh, um, uh, Standard, Standard's contention uh, on the centralized judicial review were um, not accepted by the Italian Constitutional Court, this probably triggered a reaction from the Court of Justice that enabled the modification of the macro level and the development of uh, primacy and uh, this application as we know, as we know today. So uh, I really think Standard can be regarded as an architect, as a father of legal mobilization, uh, because he um, uh, enabled and made it clear that the preliminary ruling procedure could be used uh, as uh, an infringement procedure for every European citizen in every member state, because those issues refer to uh, the interpretation of the treaty. And so that the references concerning the compatibility between national law and community law could be reframed as uh, questions of interpretation of community law, thus enabling what would then be uh, the Euro lawyers uh, saga and uh, that uh, Tom Pavon has analyzed in his uh, forthcoming book. And I think is best described by this, uh, by, the, by this painting here of the kind of lawyer suggesting the solution or at least the preliminary reference to the national, to the national judge in order to ensure a preliminary reference. So thank you very much um, for your attention. And these are the acknowledgements for the pictures I've used in this presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amedeo. Thank you for telling this, this story, all the, all the stories actually behind uh, Costa Enel, actually also the story of this uh, particular and peculiar lawyer behind the case. So now I think we should, I should leave the floor to the discussant of this first panel on the origins of EU law mobilization, who is Morten Rasmussen. This should, also, should already be uh, in, uh, connected with us. Hi, hi Morten, welcome. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Martin is associate professor at the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Martin, welcome again, and you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, let me just uh, thank you first for the invitation to contribute to this wonderful and interesting conference. I'm pleased to be here, although in an online capacity. I will surely miss coffee and the Italian biscuit serves in the courtyard of uh, Villa Salviati, I think. Um, thank you also for two great presentations and papers. So let me address the two papers individually and then add a longer commentary on the preliminary reference mechanism where I will try to place it in a historical perspective. So congratulations, Kain, on such a great paper and also article behind the paper which you presented here. I think it really displayed the historical and what an historical and archive based uh, research can deliver in terms of nuance and context and how to understand a case in its time. So it's not a case, you know, understood as part of a legal system in terms of legal analysis. It's actually a case understood uh, in its proper historical context. And that adds nuance, that adds understanding of what the case was actually about at that time. And I think uh, your paper shows how far you can get uh, with this kind of empirical depth that you can produce through serious and systematic archival work. So I think you demonstrate how various broader contexts needs to be taken into account uh, when analyzing the first preliminary references uh, sent from Dutch courts. Uh, the Dutch constitutional reforms of the 50s, of course, contributed to the questions sent. So 
uh, due to the constitutional reforms of the mid 50s, Dutch courts sent questions about uh, direct effect because such norms would uh, have a primacy over national law inside the Dutch constitutional context. But you also show, and, and that had been missing uh, until you published the article, right, that there were large Dutch corporations in a relatively open economy that were really interested in employing and using the European treaty framework uh, to pursue their own interest in breaking up uh, Dutch economic law. And uh, that's also why they were kind of a, a driving force here in the Dutch context. And uh, you know they did the kind of research and some of their lawyers that were hired by them did some kind of the research on how could this new legal framework actually be used. Then I think also you address uh, something that uh, I think it was first uh, promoted this kind of interpretation by Karen Alter that you could have these kind of test cases by lawyers, right? This was something that, that she came out with quite early in her work from uh, the early 2001 in her book on uh, the victory of supremacy in European law and something that was then pursued by Antoine Boshi and myself as a kind of way of thinking about these key doctrinal cases. And I think you add some great nuance to that story in the Dutch case, right? By showing that originally the Van Gent case was actually not a test case, so to speak. It was a lawyer who had his head way too much down into the business of tariff law to actually care too much about, about the ECs as such. But I think one question I have for you um, is actually uh, uh, still this kind of test case, because I think while you have added nuance, when the question of the Van Gent case actually came to the European level, it was used as a test case, wasn't it? By the Euro lawyers that were then involved, because there were, one thing is that you had the Dutch lawyer involved at national level, but at the European level, it was a new set of lawyers. So that would just be one kind of a question. I'm sure the audience may have, have further questions, but one thing I would like to know in a paper, which I really think sets the standard for this story and therefore, I don't have any, um, being my a historian myself, I sympathize with your approach. So I don't have any really critical remarks. I think it's just a, a, a really a, a central piece to understanding this, this story. And then uh, Mateo, uh, thank you also there for, for a great paper, which I've had the chance to comment on several times. So I'm not so sure I can add uh, something uniquely new here. And I, I will also just answer uh, kind of a question where I'm curious about how you would respond and what you would add to your story. I think again, as with Kain, you have now little by little, you know, acted more and more like a historian, digging into archives, digging into all sorts of contextual material, reading up on the history of uh, Italian political economy, the history of Italian politics, and taking this guy, Stendardi, which was perhaps first introduced in the, in the literature by a, an early article by Antoine Boucher and kind of added to that uh, early story that Antoine wrote and, and giving it much more flesh and, and bringing in this historical context. And I think uh, the, the more times I hear you give this paper, uh, the more precise uh, the analysis is and the more interesting the kind of factual uh, contextualization that you add. But something I'm really curious about is how does this story that you tell actually fit inside the Italian reception story of European law from 1950 to let's say uh, the early 1970s. So how important was it? How did it change the debates that were going on in Italy at the time? Um, and so that's something I would actually like to know. And then I would like to do something else apart from these uh, smaller questions to, to the two papers. And that's actually to add a little bit about the history of the preliminary reference mechanism. Because it's, like, it's a kind of a crucial historical context for these two papers. What was actually the, the, this mechanism about and how was it used? How was it perceived at the time? And I think also it speaks, uh, hopefully I will be able to speak also indirectly to some of the panels that will follow because I think it must be kind of a key, um, let's say a key analysis that we need to make in a conference such as this uh, to, to proper understand how this preliminary reference mechanism developed over time because it was not understood in the same way uh, all through history, right? It has a kind of a dynamic history. So let's just, let me just begin with an overview of the history of preliminary reference mechanism, which uh, is such a key tool, as I said, for lawyers and litigants in European law. Originally, of course, it was 
uh, formulated in the famous Group de Redaction, the legal committee that negotiated the Treaty of Rome on basis of 41 of the Article Article 41 of the Treaty of Paris, a, a preliminary reference system in the Cohen Steel community that had really not been in use. However, I think to understand how the Group de Redaction discussed it and how they, they designed the preliminary reference mechanism, it's important to understand the context in which it was formulated and how it was originally intended or, formed or understood. So during the treaties of Rome, the consensus among national governments was really to create a community that was primarily run by national governments and administrations. And where progress in the integration process depended on the will of the member states, so to speak. This was said quite clearly in speeches and internally in the negotiations. As a consequence, the EC was to be based on two international treaties and not a constitution. That was clear. And the key institutions became the council of ministers that would flesh out the community and the concrete policies from primary law through subordinate legislation. That was the kind of institutional core system, uh, but also the legislative system. So the Groupe de Redaction actually followed this mandate quite closely and set up a legal system that would not intrude on the integrity of national constitutional systems. This is clear from the way they designed, they designed the infringement mechanisms where they explicitly decided to avoid any role for individuals in the committee. And also they adopted a certain politicization of the mechanism of infringement where the commission would kind of warn the member state and set up a political procedure before it would sue the member state before the court. And also the option of fines for the infringing member state uh, was also removed. It was also clear with the case of Article 173, where it was made much more difficult for the individuals to question the legality of European legislations than it had been uh, in Article 33 of the Treaty of Paris and in the European Code of the Community. And also, it was also largely the case with legislative acts, even though the picture is slightly more complex, here, directives were considered to be the main and the primary tool, but the dynamics of the negotiations meant that directly applicable legal norms were also to some extent introduced with the regulation, but also in the primary uh, legal uh, or in the treaty itself. So the key here is actually, remember what I said, right? The committee, the Groupe de Redaction, designed the treaty not to intrude on national constitutional systems, because if they had done so, that would not follow uh, the kind of political mandate and consensus at the conference. So this was also the case with Article 177. This was going to be designed to ensure the uniformity of interpretation of European law across member states. The proposal, proposal that came from Italian Avvocato dello Stato, Nicola Catalano, who was a FOIA employee of the legal service of the high authority and a future judge of the European Court of Justice from 58 to 62. He was also quite known as a federalist inclined lawyer. And um, he clearly wanted to push the, the let's say the legal uh, order in a more federal directions. The negotiations took place actually in the days following the decisions of the committee on the infringement procedure that had disappointed Catalano. To Catalano, the infringement procedure would not protect individuals and firms if their own government was the perpetrator by not applying European law in a member state. And he also believed the commission would not have the resources or political capital to deal with all cases of infringement. So Catalano proposed to create a preliminary reference mechanism where the court of justice would deal not only with the interpretation of European law, but also crucially its application. And this latter point was controversial because it implied that the European court of justice would have a decisive word in the concrete application of European law inside national constitutional orders. And thus it broke with the funda fundamental consensus of the of the, that the government had de developed. So a majority of the committee therefore rejected the notion that a system uh, and formulated a system where the court of justice would only deal with the interpretation of European law, not its application. And any language suggesting that even a judgment on the interpretation of European law was kind of obliged for national courts to be applied was also removed from uh, the article. So the system would be more limited 
and rest on the cooperation of national courts, it would be voluntary for lower courts and obligatory only for courts of last instances. So national constitutions were kept intact. It was kind of created for to, to be made through the cooperation between national courts and the court of justice. So would this mechanism play an important role? At the time, this was not so clear. Catalano clearly understood the potential of the mechanism to supplant, supplement the infringement mechanism by allowing litigants and cooperative national courts to police the application of European law in their respective country. So if you read Catalano's book on the treaties of Rome from 1957, written more or less at the same time as the negotiations were happening and right after, he understood the potential. However, not everybody did. Pierre Pascatore, for example, did not believe that the mechanism would matter really in the building of a European legal order in an article from 1959. Godet was more perceptive and believed it could be important, but it was unclear whether it would be. Another example that we have dug out from archives over the confusion of the new mechanism was a discussed between, was a, was a meeting between uh, the uh, ECJ judges and the Dutch Ministry of Justice in 1959. The court did a tour around Europe and it met these Dutch lawyers in Amsterdam and The Hague. And here Lacan came out and said quite clearly, he, they were basically asked by the Dutch lawyers, how, how are we going to deal with this mechanism? What, what, what are the national courts supposed to do? And Lacan came out and said, send as few cases as possible. We don't want too many cases. That would really be disturbing, right? And then Catalano went directly in and said the opposite. He said, send as many cases as you can. This is a crucial way of building a European legal order. So in 1959, 1960, you have to understand that nobody really understood which questions to send and how many. And um, a good kind of um, introduction to those debates could actually be to visit the historical archive in Florence and take a look at Michel Valbrook's private papers that had been handed in some years ago, where a young Michel Valbrook discusses with a young Dutch lawyer, Alexander, where they exactly have a lot of private letters kind of describing these debates and debating between themselves about how actually to understand the preliminary reference mechanism. Right? Another and final example of how difficult it was to understand was the French government's response in the Bosch case in 61, 62. The French government argued on basis of the, I think the general view during the treaties or Rome negotiations, they argued that a question like the Bosch case that was dealing with the application of European law would be inadmissible. But of course we know the court did not think so. It in the end would accept a very wide range of questions. So part of the early development of the case law of the court leading directly to the breakthrough of the inter constitutional interpretation of European law in Van Gendt and Bose and Costa and El, and also the empowerment of the court that kind of came out of that, uh, was really starting in this very broad definition of the preliminary reference question and how, what kind of questions you could send to Luxembourg. A definition that I would say clearly was in some contradiction with what the Coupe de Rédaction had actually originally designed in 1957. This did not mean, of course, that this new system, even after the, what we have called the legal revolution and the widening of what kind of questions you could send from national courts, it did not mean that the system actually worked so well. In most member states, national courts did not warm easily to a foreign or international court and in particular, not one that had claimed European law to be a new special legal order, which included direct effect and primacy, two doctrines that controversially imply that national constitutional clauses on the reception of international law would be set aside to the new system designed solely by the Court of Justice. And I think we can read this skepticism and reluctance out of the figures of cases flowing to Luxembourg. So if we look at those, just the 1960s, 107 cases in total, not so many. Huh? This only began to grow in the mid 1970s, but we have to get to 1978 to see more than 100 cases sent by national courts. And to become a serious number, we have to go to the mid 1980s. So it was only by the late 1980s 
of course, that the political importance of the single market to the member states finally forced national courts to accept and work within the system of the new legal order that underpinned the single market. So from the late 1980s, litigation is arguably overwhelmingly driven by societal demand by firms, social groups, and individuals who want to draw on European law. But I think we have to be careful. Before 1980, for example, we need to think very carefully about what drives this system of preliminary references. And let me just finish this small in kind of contribution by discussing what factors may play a role and that can perhaps help inform our debate on this today. You can say, firstly, while the Court of Justice and judges and pro-European legal scholars already in the early 1970s celebrated the cooperation of national courts, you know, we know actually that national courts did generally not cooperate so widely in the new system before the 1980s. Not to say that in certain member states like Belgium or the Netherlands, that court cases was not sent. It was to a respectable degree. But in other countries like Denmark and France, you would have governments and administrations that would make sure in periods, significant periods of time in the 70s uh, and 60s, that almost no cases were sent from Danish and French courts. So I think to argue that courts as a general factor was a key driver is probably not something we should do. That there we have to get a very nuanced picture. Then you could say, okay, it must be societal demand that is driving this. This is a new legal framework. Firms and, and individuals can use it to pursue their interests. But I think we have to be careful there too. I think we can see, for example, in the Dutch case, that there you can have instances where societal demand, big firms who want to use this new framework for legal uh, litigation, right? There you can see this kind of, of option, but there are other cases uh, where I would say, we have to understand what the EU actually was in the 60s and 70s. It was basically a common agriculture policy with a customs union and a fragmented common market. So how big was the societal demand actually for legal integration of a judgment from the Court of Justice? I think we have to be careful there too and map this uh, uh, before we actually decide that there was this very strong societal demand uh, in a general way. And then the third factor, of course, that could drive the system is one that we will discuss very much today. That is the agency of lawyers. So to what extent was it pro-European lawyers, perhaps, as argued in Tommaso Pavone's interesting research, that both for professional, but also very much ideological reasons, helped build the European legal order through preliminary references in the 60s and 70s. I think from uh, the group of historians that worked with European law over the last decade, I think our intuition, and we also have many examples here and there in our work without studying it systematically as Thomas Pavone has done and Lola Avril, I think what our impression is that very often important cases were pursued by lawyers with a quite pro-European uh, uh, kind of viewpoint. So this is something that we also can do um, more research on and discuss. So to conclude this intervention, I think because the preliminary reference systems system for the period, say from 1958 to 18, to the mid 1980s is such a crucial mechanism for the European Court of Justice to build its legal order, what factors drove the cases is really a crucial historical question. And to answer it, I think we have, need to have this very broad approach uh, to look for potential driving forces. And I also would suggest uh, that what we need is perhaps less the kind of uh, quantitative research that has dominated research on the preliminary reference mechanism until now. But I think what we need is much more qualitative and uh, preferably archive-based uh, research to actually begin to understand what was driving these cases in the 60s and 70s. So I hope I managed to contribute with something interesting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morton, for your fascinating comments. 
uh, especially on the hist for reminding us the history about the history of the preliminary reference procedure. And um, before starting our discussion, I would ask to, to the people here in the room, since the people outside Villa Salviati outnumber the people inside Villa Salviati, maybe we can squeeze the coffee break and have a, a, a slightly broader discussion. Uh, so we can actually also collect some questions from the people connected um, through Zoom. Uh, actually, you can also type your questions in the chat box or you can um, unmute your microphone and directly ask your question um, verbally. So I don't know if our speakers would like to, to react to, the, to Morton's comments and observations. I don't know if Karin has something to, to say, for instance. Yes, yes, Karin, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm also, of course, happy. Oh, sorry. Yes, there we go. I'm also, of course, happy to wait for further questions from, from the audience. So um, uh, please uh, um, uh, continue to, 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 to raise those. Um, well, first of all, of course, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, for your, uh, your interesting comment. Uh, we've discussed this matter uh, quite a lot. Um, um, and I'm also very grateful for your comment about, uh, or your question about uh, the role of, uh, uh, of pro-European lawyers and, and the, the question whether this is not in some way also a test case. Uh, and, and yeah, that has been of course uh, 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 on my mind uh, quite a lot, uh, also because there is indeed the involvement of some of the most prominent members of the, the Dutch uh, Free Day uh, branch. So, uh, um, Ter Kuyle, Wijkerheld um, Bisdom, a few very active uh, voices in the Dutch uh, early debate about European law are also um, uh, uh, joining in these cases from the moment that they actually get uh, uh, sent to Luxembourg. So not necessarily before, but afterwards, certainly they are uh, important. Uh, partly, of course, they are hired simply because they have the expertise that those very plain tax lawyers and, and, and other uh, uh, lawyers do not have. But certainly, of course, they have a, a very keen interest. And in some of the cases that do not actually read, uh, reach Luxembourg, um, there is the, the meat trading case that I mentioned. There is another case, International Petershoek. Those are actually started as test cases. But the, the, the funny thing is, or a bit maybe the shame for these people, of course, is that, well, their efforts don't really lead to the most famous cases, but actually the other ones and in which they were less involved, at least in the initial stage. Uh, but certainly there is an active involvement, um, both through these, let's say, as, as uh, uh, lawyers on the cases. But I think what is even maybe more crucial is the role of some others. I already mentioned uh, Ivo Sankalden, who is first the Minister of Justice and later on is a, is a, a professor in European law in, in Leiden. And then at the same time also is in the Dutch Senate, so he's really everywhere. And I think people like him, they really managed to influence the debate by um, yeah, acting on all those stages, combining that lecturing before, let's say, yeah, um, groups of, of uh, uh, lawyers who have no clue about European law and telling them to actually start filing uh, preliminary reference cases. Um, uh, yeah, indeed, in the Senate, asking critical questions about a certain uh, way of approaching EU law, etc. So I think maybe the more crucial role is even there with, with him and some, some others um, uh, uh, than uh, with those lawyers involved in these, in these cases. And maybe one thing to build on that, uh, because I think Amadeo's um, um, uh, discussion of, of um, uh, the role of Sandardi, or especially also his motivations, uh, sounded very interesting also from the Dutch perspective, because I think what we've so far uh, very much highlighted and, and I think just uh, uh, to some extent justified is that those lawyers were very much driven by their interest in um, indeed establishing the European legal order as, as a cause in itself. Um, but what I find very interesting is this nuance or this, this uh, new dimension that Amadeo added um, where we also see that these were lawyers very concerned or very interested by upholding the rule of law in a period in which, uh, let's say, socialists got into government. And now, of course, uh, I mean, in the Dutch case, this is quite complex because uh, Sam Cullen was himself of the Dutch Socialist Party, uh, but he was of the wing that, that was indeed very much concerned also about individual rights and 
um, indeed uh, keeping checks on, uh, let's say, uh, new um, uh, uh, government interventions, etc. So in that sense, I think there is, on the one hand, very much the engagement with the European legal order, but maybe actually also this European legal order serves another uh, purpose that can that is more difficult to achieve on the national level, uh, which is indeed this more broad concern for. Uh, the rule of uh, rule of law uh, and and guarantees that actually maybe European law can offer there. Uh, so that's also really something that uh, I think applies very well to uh, to the case I uh, I discussed. Thanks for that. All right. Uh, so I also like to uh, follow up on Karin's comment. What I really like about her paper is the kind of balance she strikes between the meso level, the micro level. So it was not only the Dutch context that made things easier, but also uh, uh, the activism of these uh, these lawyers. But there is another element that I really enjoyed, and uh, I would say that is the element of conflict. So we're talking about legal mobilization. We're talking about strategic views of litigation. So uh, motives, I think, are essential, and one essential motive is conflict, is fear. Uh, Heraclitus said the conflict is the father of all things. And uh, it seems that also in Van Gen that played a very important role. So apparently the court that referred the Van Gen case uh, um, felt uh, um, kind of overruled by the Dutch legislature in adopting these new, these new custom duties. And that probably triggered the reaction and the preliminary ruling. And the conflict element, of course, is clearly visible in, in Standardis reaction against uh, this uh, uh, kind of political liaison between the Christian Democrats and, um, and the socialists uh, in, uh, in the nationalization of electricity in 1962. Uh, and again, in the Chevalier and Borromeo case in the 1970. But I think the conflict element should also be investigated if we want to look in more general fashion and legal mobilization also at uh, the meso and uh, and the macro level um, uh, so um, for example what made it possible um, for the same judges for the judges that uh, in 1963 were four three in favor of uh, direct effect to be seven zero in favor of primacy in Costa. Again, it was another conflict element, this time a kind of polit of legal pressure from the Italian constitutional court, the desire to react to that conception of community law as a more of a traditional international treaty that could not be accepted without undermining the court of justice as an institution and European economic community as a, as a whole project. So I think it's really interesting to look at uh, this conflict dimension of legal mobilization. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amedeo. And I think we have also a question here in the room from Virginia, if I saw correctly. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maria. Thank you all for, for this very first uh, fascinating panel. Um, I have a, I mean, listening to Karin and to Amedeo, I, I, I thought about a question that I wanted to ask you, which is very much related to what you said about these meso factors, because you both interacted with them. I mean, we can also call them like national factors of legal mobilization before the court of justice, like, like national context. Regarding the national context, I was very intrigued by Karin's account of the Dutch context as a context favorable in a way to legal mobilization before the court of justice, because of some elements that she, highlighted but it was curious about the judicial review element which is something that you you haven't mentioned Karin and I was very curious about and it's always something that intrigued me about the Dutch case because I know that before Dutch courts you cannot really challenge the validity of a Dutch law in terms of constitutional law so you cannot challenge the constitutionality of the law and for that reason the fact that this is a monist system it's it's particularly important because instead you can challenge national law vis-a-vis -vis international law and european law so in a way the, the direct effect and the supremacy of eu law brought judicial review into into the dutch system correct me if i'm wrong right because i'm i'm <laughs> i'm not a dutch lawyer of course um so i was wondering whether there was this element also in in the litigation so if if van Gen and laws was indeed um a legal mobilization case what what was the role of constitutional law what was the role of the fact that it in fact opened up a very important avenue to bring judicial review in in the dutch system this is something that then I know because of my research, it was then exploited in so many different fields of law in many different political domains. So I, I would like to know whether there was any awareness. Because on the other hand, listening to Amedeo, 
that did play a role. Stendardi already envisaged this, this consequence, and that is fascinating to me when it comes to Stendardi. He had such a, a broad perspective about EU law and, and Italian constitution. And, and so, um, yeah, that, that's just a comment and a question for you. Thanks. Well, um, let me try to be brief on, on the Dutch uh, situation. Um, so indeed, um, uh, there was this conflict, uh, you could say, between the way that, uh, um, well, judicial review in a way was allowed for international law, or at least those international law provisions with like uh, binding on any, uh, anyone, which was a kind of a, a, a new uh, a phrase, but which was meant or introduced in the mid 50s, it was at least held um, by, uh, by a majority of parliament to just, let's say, confirm what had already been standing practice in the Netherlands um, uh, since the interwar period uh, with regard to, to international law. So there was on the one hand this situation where indeed international law could immediately uh, directly be mobilized. And on the other hand, there was indeed this ban on judicial uh, review of um, legislation against uh, the constitution. And, that conflict that had also been explicitly discussed um, during uh, the constitutional reform um, in the mid 50s. So that was just very shortly before, of course, these developments in European law uh, started to, uh, to, to um, uh, be, yeah, be, be present. And, um, and, and, and it was also acknowledged that this was kind of strange because it gave courts some rights that they didn't have in uh, the national context, so against the nation for, for the national constitution. And in that sense, there was the broad expectation that courts would be very reticent with using this um, uh, uh, capacity, with using this possibility, because that used to be, or that, that was supposed to be very much the Dutch legal tradition of courts um, being quite reticent. And if already they, they um, changed legislation, then they would try to do so in some kind of a, a conciliatory conciliatory way to, to interpret um, it uh, in such a way that it wasn't really rejecting uh, the, the national law, etc. So um, that was on the one hand the expectation. And I think what also explains why nevertheless the Dutch legislator uh, uh, went along with or why they tried, why they decided to have the constitution um, reviewed in this way was really the, the importance of trying to um, change the way, not just domestically, but also internationally, change the way in which international law was dealt with, because that was very much perceived as being in the Dutch interest that actually not just Dutch courts, but also uh, elsewhere, courts would in fact um, uh, be involved in upholding international law, because yeah, as, as a small country, that was something that could not be achieved in, on the political level so, so much so that they really felt that that was in a way uh, in the Dutch interest to give the good example there. So in that sense, it was really seen as a separate issue. Um, and, and that also was, uh, well, how it was explained. Um, and yes, um, uh, still, this was a very new thing. So that also explains, let's say, how uh, these first court cases developed. I think in, in the case of the competition articles, there was not that much debate about um, this article having direct effect, uh, because that was quite clear from the phrasing that that would in all cases in, in the Dutch uh, uh, understanding be uh, uh, yeah, a, 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 um, a provision to which this uh, binding on anyone uh, a clause would, would uh, apply. But that was of, uh, in the Van Gent and Loos case, that was actually the crucial um, uh, uh, question. And, and it was asked in this particular way and Martin already uh, uh, related to that um, because of the phrasing of the Dutch constitution. So it was very much the Dutch constitution that actually led uh, to um, the way in which this, this particular question was phrased. And then later on also it was in the end uh, also becoming part of the EU law uh, doctrine. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Okay, thank you, Karin, also for uh, for uh, for your answers. And do we have uh, some questions from the from the crowd inside or outside Florence? Amedeo would like to say something. Yes. 
All right. Uh, no, I also like to thank Virginia for raising this uh, fascinating point about the meso level for judicial review as a country tradition, because indeed probably that's uh, an important difference between the Dutch system and the Italian system. So in Italy, as of course you know, uh, uh, judicial, uh, judicial review of constitutionality was introduced by the constitution that entered into force in 1948, but had already been theorized by the Napolitan constitution of 1799, thanks to someone called Mario Pagano, not the one in this room. But uh, <laughs> however, interestingly, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of experience with the system because it was only in 1956 that it actually became operational. And uh, it, I think it also provides an interesting insight at the micro level and that enables me also to address uh, Morton's remarks uh, in a way. Um, so uh, Standardi also happened to be a pioneer of constitutional litigation in Italy. He wrote the book on the Italian Constitutional Court, one of the earliest ever published, and he was the lawyer in the third ever case decided by the Italian Constitutional Court. So. Uh, in, and what was the reception history of the, of, the treaty of, of the treaties of Rome in Italy? Well, it's difficult to summarize, but long story short, Italy was a country of dualist tradition. So if you look at the debate, most scholars with the notable exception of Quadri were really thinking about an, an international treaty where, uh, and, and the hierarchy of legal sources were thinking about the statute, uh, the ratification statute. So uh, probably to, uh, it was essential for Standard to have a slightly different background than the one of a traditional international law scholar. It was a constitutional scholar. In another book, he compares uh, um, freedom and equality, uh, freedom and equality are balanced against one another in different legal systems, including the uh, British legal system, the American system, the Soviet legal system. So he was also, also had an experience in comparative constitutional law. And so I think it was absolutely essential for, his, for, for Standard to bring this kind of different mindset into the debate. And so uh, that is the kind of synth synthesis that was achieved in, in Costa Vienna. Other questions uh, from the people connected through Zoom, or or we can close the session if you if you don't want to ask anything. Ah, Maria, Maria, prego. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Karin and Amideo, both of you, for uh, uh, these great presentations and uh, almost stories. <laughs> Um, I have a question for Amedeo. I don't know if it's a question, but it's um, a, a bit along the lines of what Karim was saying. I, what I find really fascinating in the, in the figure of Stendardi uh, is this fact of um, uh, maybe also building upon what uh, Martin was saying. You know, he has these two sides, these two sides of motivations. On the one hand, um, you argue, uh, for example, he argued in favor of primacy, so he's very much interested in, the, in, in that side of the, you know, uh, the, uh, of the uh, EU legal order, but actually his motivations are political. And what you were saying also in the second case when, where he was using the uh, indirect uh, ju judicial review, this proves again that actually was more driven by, by a political belief behind that, no? in the case of uh, Enel against the uh, nationalization of Enel. So he, he's, he fits a bit, the, both cases in, in, uh, in what Martin was saying, you know, the, so the, the idea of societal demand of politically driven uh, legal mobilization, but at the same time also the lawyer was very much uh, uh, trying to bring forward something, you know, at the, at the more level of the, of the EU political order. And I would say, you know, it's just, I don't know, curious about, it's, it's really, fa as, as a fascinating figure, as you say, as a, the father of legal mobilization, maybe also someone who is, I don't know, has tried a lot of different things out and thank you. Again, that's an excellent point. Uh, I'm writing Standardis biography, and one section is entitled uh, Gian Galeazzo Standardis Scholar, Lawyer, and Political Activists, because the three components are one and the same in the same person. And what's interesting is that he uh, theorizes that in his 1967 book on the role of the individual in the community legal order. So he really believes in uh, activism of the individual, possibly out of his disappointment and his concerns about Italian representative democracy. So uh, in what really happened between 57 and, uh, and, and, and 62 for Standardi apparently was really important. The Christian democracy decided to take on a different ally and probably felt betrayed uh, in a way, or at least that the Christian democracy was not acting in, in keeping with the promises made 
to the electors. So he thought the, it, but the, he even notes that in uh, in one page of uh, of the six seven work. So it's not so important that the European Parliament is not erected directly for the individual to have a role in the development of EU legal order. All that matters is that the individual has the right of action. In this way, he or she can make his or her contribution to the development of the legal system. And I think this is a clearly in line with the Rudolf Foyering uh, struggles for law approach. And I think for that reason, he can be regarded as one of the fathers of legal mobilization because he enabled many other lawyers and private parties to contribute to the development of a legal order by fueling the engine of judicialization, fueling integration through case law, so to speak. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can close this, uh, this session. So. Let me thank you, Karin, uh, Karin Van Leuven. Thank you very much also to Amedeo, of course, and to Morten Rasmussen uh, for acting as a discussant. I think we can close this session and we can have a 13 minutes break uh, and we can reconvene at 4 p.m. Okay, thank you very much and see you in a few minutes. Good afternoon. Um... We can start now with the second uh, panel of today's conference, the mobilization of EU law. Hello, I can see our speakers connected and our discussant, Antoine. Hello. Very happy to see you and welcome. So my name is Virginia Pasaraco. I'm gonna chair the second panel. This is a bit of a marathon since we don't have a, 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 an actual official break between this panel and the third one, but we're gonna try to have at least five minutes of, of break between the two. So I'm gonna be strict with the time. So I'm very happy to welcome all of you here. And we have also uh, one of the speaker, Tommaso, connecting from uh, the other side of the ocean. So I'm very, very happy to have you here. And Lamine from, from the Netherlands, it's wonderful. We're going to continue our interdisciplinary conversation on the history of the mobilization of EU law. So we started with Van Hengen laws and Costa versus Zena, so the very foundational cases of the EU legal order and the supremacy of EU law and the direct effect of EU law. And now we're gonna continue focusing a bit more on the actors. So this panel is on the developments and I'm gonna leave the floor, first of all, of one of the in-presence actually participant of this conference. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Lola Avril. Lola uh, has, holds a PhD in political science from the University of Paris en Sorbonne. Her dissertation studied the rise, the institutionalization, and the forms of contestation of regulatory lawyers. She was a member of the Folie project at Sciences Po. And then she was also a Max Weber Fellow here at the UI, where we met her. And now she's a research associate in the project, the Court of Justice in the Archive. So a very good uh, speaker for this event, of course. Uh, Lola will present a, a paper called Legal Mobilizations, Euro Lawyers and the Development of European Competition Law, 1962-1989. The floor is yours, Lola. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Normally you can see my screen. Um, so first I would like to thank the organizer, of course, for letting me letting me present. Sorry, is it better? Yeah. Um, so for letting me present my work in such um, in such good company. And uh, also I was perhaps so excited that to have an in-person conference that I was perhaps a bit too ambitious on what I want to say today. So Virginia, don't hesitate to wave the <laughs> arms and like, just, uh, yeah, make some signs if I'm, if I'm over uh, after the deadline. Um, also another disclaimer that I took the mobilization for EU law here a little bit in a broader sense, uh, mobilization of EU lawyers, mobilization for EU law and its development, and mobilization of EU law to pursue some professional interests, um, the Euro lawyers' interests. Um, so we all know that the, I think in this room that the EU is a legal construct and European integration mainly a legal process since the big socio-historical turn in EU studies. We also know that lawyers as uh, the main actors also of this process, lawyers from various institutions, but private actors remain largely ignored. Um, and why is that? Because there is this assumption that there is a mechanical development as law expanded, law, European law expanded, there was a development of European law, there would have been mechanically 
the rise of euro lawyers, of private practitioners interested in EU law and the development of department of EU law in private law firms. So asking the mobilization or trying to see the mobilization of euro lawyers is also really um, having a new, I think, view on their agency and how they could have contributed to the EU legal integration. I'm going to draw here on my PhD research, as Virginia has said, but also on my work as Max Weber Fellow and Research Associate for the Court in the Archives Project, and especially on two forthcoming chapter for collective books, and I put here the, the references. Uh, my approach here uh, tries to articulate sociology of profession and political sociology of the EU. My empirical entry point will be competition law, European competition law, and the roles of Euro lawyers, so really focusing on private practitioners. And I rely for this on uh, archival materials as well as interviews that I conducted during my PhD research. Uh, let me uh, just tell you a little bit about my research findings. First, lawyers did not respond to a greater demand for their services, but they created this demand. Uh, so we go here from a passive role of private practitioners to a co-constitution process between, on the one hand, a body of, of professionals uh, specializing in EU, EU law, and on the other end, on uh, some EU institutions, especially the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. Another thing is that legal mobilization is just one of man, the many modalities of Euro lawyers' mobilization. They don't just go to court, and they have uh, other tools to, um, to, 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 to advance their interests at the, at the EU level. Uh, I will focus here especially on three times, three moments uh, of the development of EU competition. First, how they get into competition policies, which was not uh, exactly um, uh, a success at the beginning. Uh, second, how they also mobilize to disseminate EU law. And finally, how they mobilize to reform the EU judicial system. Uh, and here I will take the example of the Court of uh, First Instance and its creation in 1989. That's why the, the paper title uh, has this uh, uh, chronological, chronological bound, boundaries. Um, so first, how did private practitioners broke into uh, EU competition policies? Uh, as I said, so we know that there is this first regulation on agreements and concerted practice adopted in 1962. And this in this regulation, we have no mention of lawyers at all. And actually, it was meant to be European Commission officials aimed to avoid intermediaries in their working processes. They, see, they saw um, lawyers as delaying the process, making it too costly, too, too, too long. So they really favored direct exchanges between the commission and uh, companies without lawyers, but also written exchanges, avoiding um, the development of hearings. We could uh, link uh, the administrative procedure too much to a judicial procedure. So from the beginning of the 1970s, we, have, we see some pressures to reform this procedure. Legal professionals supported by business interests expressed concerns about the legal certainty, the predictability of the outcome of competition cases, especially during this administrative phase where the EG competition was handling the case. And they advocated for the codification, the formalization, and the judicialization of competition procedures, meaning the import of the judicial principle into the administrative procedures, the right to be heard, the right to recourse to a lawyer, having legal privilege uh, during this, uh, apply during these procedures, etc. Uh, for this, they did uh, first a mobilization through their professional associations. And here, uh, there is a, a big role of the International Bar Association and its Antitrust Committee, which was created in 1970. Um, the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, which is representing all the national bars of the member states in Brussels to, um, to the, the European institutions, and the Law and Society and the Inns of Bar in the UK, which represent uh, solicitors and barristers in the UK, who set up a joint working party on the question of the procedures in competition cases. So all of these professional associations, they try to meet with DG competition throughout the 70s, they send memorandum, they send reports, etc. Second uh, way of mobilizing for the reform of the pr procedure was the judicial mobilization here, of course, and it's a long running legal battle, 26 um, Court of Justice rulings on procedural law aspect of competition law uh, between 1962 and 1982. So basically in all major competition law cases, the applicants raised a violation of the right of defense company's right to reply, right to be heard, it's like publication of the dossier, etc. We can find uh, various, but in all major competition cases, there is uh, this uh, push for a reform of the procedure. 
how was it successful? Um, first, uh, there was a success in court with the AMNS ruling in 1982, which recognized and enshrined the respect of legal privilege uh, in competition proceedings, including during the administrative phase and the legal privilege for private practitioners in law firms, independent lawyers and not in-house counsel, which is important. And also a reform of the, uh, this procedure in the beginning of the 1980s with the creation of a hearing of visa position. So also giving more importance to the hearings aspect of the uh, administrative procedures. So here we can see, see that lawyers re, uh, resorted to two types of actions. First, during the legal proceedings in the name of their client's interest, but also collectively on behalf of the profession through their representative organizations. And the repertoire they used, what the, 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 the repertoire of the rights of defense, judicialization, to secure a role in this procedure. Second example, disseminating and legitimizing EU law. Here we have to say that uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, we are talking about 10, 20 private practitioners interested in EU competition law. It was not really a, prom a promising branch of law. Uh, so they needed also to mobilize the legal community and also beyond the economic circles to convert them to this new uh, competition and trust principles. And they did it first by training a future generation of lawyers. And lucky for them, there was not so much professor trained in European law. So university recourse also to these private practitioners to teach about European law. Second, they created courses on European law, familiarizing a generation of apprentice lawyers, but also judges, in-house in -house lawyers, etc. And they also isolated European law in dedicated seminars, which means that they promoted it as a separated branch of law um, outside of international or comparative law. So here we have the example of uh, Michel Walbrock, uh, Belgium lawyers, who was a professor at the Institute of European Study in, in, uh, in Brussels, but also combined his university duties with the in law firms, uh, Dewey Ballantyne and Liedekoek, uh, especially. Second, they also uh, published a lot. And here, uh, a history book about uh, Arved de Ringer, um, law firm's history, says that he went on a marketing offensive. And from the very early stages of the European integration, they, these lawyers published in, they published books, but they also published in legal journals to um, the legal community, but also in professional journals. And here they really did a work of pedagogy, detailing the content of European competition policies, their procedures, etc. And the perfect example is here De Ringer, Albert De Ringer, who was also a member of the European Parliament, a German lawyer, who was uh, the rapporteur of the first regulation in 1962. Um, and he wrote the first commentary on EU competition, but then about 250 articles. Um, so here, as I said, it was really a marketing strategy because his clientele at that time was very small and not very interested into EU law. So he really relied on these publications and conferences to make the EU law being something that was um, interesting for his clients. Third, sorry, I'm a little bit uh, jumping into examples, but I'm going to gather this in the conclusion. But third, reforming the judicial system. And here we know that the CFI, the Court of First Instance, why it's created in 1989. And the justification is a little bit like the same for the rise of private practitioners, uh, a mechanical one, because there was a growing number of pending cases before the court, they needed to create a jurisdiction. Um, there is this article where um, uh, Leo Scholar said that the Court of First Instance origins are quite modest. Modest. But actually, if we look at the archives of the European Commission, this uh, creation is also partly the result of a mobilization led by private pra practitioners allied with the DG competition and the European Commission. So from the mid 70s, we have some demands from the president of the courts to create uh, this court of first instance. These demands are backed by the DG competition. For DG competition, it was also a way to allay criticism expressed regarding its own procedures to redirect demands for judicialization towards the EU judicial system. It was also backed by economic circles who were really critical about the lack of time and expertise for the court to examine the complex technical economic facts of competition cases. But actually, when we see the, the first ad agenda of the International Government Conference in 1985, there was no mention of the Court of First Instance. And this topic is added in November 1985. So what happened between September and November 1985, so that the CFI was actually something that was um, considered to be negotiated. There is 
a lot of letters by Avert Berenger himself, who really tried to mobilize the whole legal community and used its, his political connections to convince of the merits of the project. And here I found in the, in the archives of DG Competition a series of letters sent between September and November addressed to the German Chancellor and with call, but also to the Lord Chancellor's office in the UK, and 35 letters to all the community of European lawyers in EU competition law. At that time, it was really like um, a lot uh, of uh, EU private practitioners received this letter. Uh, and each of these letters, they had the same paragraphs. I realized, of course, that chances for the initiative of the court are not extremely well but it would in any case considerably support this initiative is as many as possible leading lawyers would approach their governments. So you really have this uh, political, judicial, legal entrepreneur with, with Arvet Dringer promoting this project and trying to gather the whole community of lawyers, of Euro lawyers to mobilize for the creation of the, of the CFI. Is it a success? Well, it's kind of difficult to determine for ava from available sources the exact conditions under which uh, this project was encored in November uh, to uh, the International Government Conference, but we know that the single act uh, which was adopted after contains provisions about the, the establishment of a court of first instance. And of course, if no document from the archives revealed the involvement of DG competition in the Ringer activism, the fact that I found these letters in uh, the archives of the the DG competition means that the EU officials were aware of, if not active parties in this lobbying uh, operation. So I'm going to conclude. Um, this mobilization approach, I think, allows really uh, to revise the role of private petition practitioners in the development of EU competition policy. Judicial mobilization is just one of the many modalities used by Euro lawyers to promote, develop, strengthen European competition law. Is it all successful mobilization? Because I think when we talk about mobilization, we always think, did it work or not? Was it successful or not? Well, here, my presentation might, might lead you to think that it was a complete success. Actually, we have to nuance it. And uh, um, private practitioners were really searching for more judicialization in administrative procedures. Uh, the composition of the CF5 is made of judges and not uh, economic experts, as some of the private practitioners wanted it. So yes, we have to. We have to nuance a bit the, the question. Um, yeah, I will uh, stop it here, I think. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Lola. This has been fascinating. Honestly, I knew little about the role of competition lawyers, and I didn't know they had such an important role even in, in the creation of the CFI. This is really, really important for our discussion. So I will now leave the floor to the second discussion, Tommaso Pavone. Let me just introduce you, Tommaso. Tommaso is an assistant professor of law and politics in the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. He received his PhD from Princeton University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Plurie Court Center of the University of Oslo. His work focuses on the EU and traces how lawyers and courts impact processes of political development and social change. So again, very relevant to this discussion. Tommaso, thanks for being here and the floor is yours. All right. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All is good? Yes, all good. I think you should share the screen so we can see your slide a bit bigger. Oh, hold on a second. I thought I, thought I was sharing the screen. Let me yeah, try that yeah. again. Okay. Can you see that well? Uh, now better. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Virginia, uh, Amedeo, and Mario for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me to participate. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to join you, if only remotely. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the evolution of Euro lawyering and its impact on the judicial construction of Europe. And to do so, I'm going to share some lessons from a forthcoming book I've authored with Cambridge University Press called the Ghost Writers, Lawyers and the Politics Behind the Judicial Construction of Europe. And the key argument of this book is that entrepreneurial lawyers have been essential agents of European legal integration by encouraging clients to deliberately break non-compliant state laws and by mobilizing national courts um, against their own governments. And today I want to briefly go over how I structured this research project and share three uh, things uh, that I found. 
Um, I'm going to focus first on the enduring impact of euro lawyers in national courts, and then I'm going to uh, talk about um, how euro lawyering has uh, evolved over time. Um, and then uh, I'm going to ask whether euro lawyering is destined for market capture or whether recent developments in the EU legal order have supplied it with a new raison d'être. So first, let me talk a little bit about on what basis am I going to make these remarks today? How did I structure this research project? Um, this project drew on fieldwork over the course of three years in the three largest founding member states of the EU, that is Italy, France, and Germany. But of course, we don't ever conduct fieldwork in countries as a whole. As uh, lowly individuals, we've got to pick uh, specific field sites. Um, so how did I go about doing that? Um, I first uh, plotted the distribution of all uh, preliminary references to the European Court of Justice since the 1960s. And of course, we know that the judicial dialogue between national courts and the European Court of Justice has been an essential motor for driving European uh, legal integration uh, and sort of crystallizing uh, a pan-European uh, uh, judiciary. Um, and after I uh, uh, plotted this patchwork distribution of preliminary references, I chose to visit some field sites where a lot of references have historically emerged. We might call these hotspots in the judicialized enforcement of European law. And I counterbalance these field sites with more intermediate or cold spot locations to try to figure out what was hampering European legal mobilization in those communities. And over the course of field research, I gathered three original sources of data, not just the geocoded preliminary references that I just showed you, but I also conducted interviews with over 350 law, uh, lawyers, judges, and law professors. And then I gathered a number of archival documents from the personal records of lawyers, from newspaper archives, as well as, of course, from the historical archives um, of the EU. And one of the primary findings of the book, if not the primary finding of the book, is that euro lawyering before national courts broke with the traditional ways in which we see lawyers' role in society. We tend to see lawyers as go-betweens or as resources to be mobilized by clients. And in this model, uh, a client who is rights conscious uh, solicits uh, the services of a lawyer who then represents the interests of that client before an authoritative and knowledgeable judge who then renders a judicial decision. What Euro lawyers did before national courts was different. They acted as what I called ghostwriters of legal mobilization, where, as Lola pointed out, they didn't wait for a clientele to turn to them. They actively mobilized the clientele, made them aware of their European legal rights, um, often by networking with uh, business associations to find clients willing to lodge test cases. And then the client would perform a solicitation before the lawyer, who would then turn to a judge, which was almost uniform, uniformly um, undertrained in European law and overworked. And so then they would propose a ghost written de decision and a preliminary reference to the Court of Justice that the judge would then adopt. With the primary difference between these two models, that whereas in the go between model, agency and legal change flows through the lawyer. In the ghostwriter model, it radiates out of the lawyer who becomes the primary architect of legal mobilization. Now, all roads uh, in the early years, in the 1960s, 1970s, and early 1980s, pointed to just about a dozen teams of Euro lawyers who pioneered this, this repertoire. And here they are across Italy, France, and Germany with proper names. Now, as you might uh, expect, these lawyers were not representative of the bar as a whole. They had certain distinguishing traits in common. First of all, all of them survived the Second World War and were old enough to remember the war. Some had their property expropriated, lost family members, or had their own close calls with death, which meant that they were very skeptical of state power and they wanted to moderate it. They were politically committed to uniting European states through legal, non-coercive means. Second, the majority of them acted upon this political drive by founding the first transnational lawyers associations meant to promote knowledge and practice of European law, including uh, FIDE and its uh, national branches. And finally, as I consulted the writings and spoke with the pioneers who were still alive, it was clear that they saw their lawyering as a politics via other means, and they relished their capacity to catalyze state reforms in a wide variety of areas 
through their litigation efforts. Now, what's really striking is that these 12 teams of lawyers solicited almost half of all preliminary references to the ECJ through 1980, almost 500 preliminary references over uh, the course of their lifetime. Some 88 courts across 74 cities solicited the ECJ for the first time when one of these pioneers showed up. And what's more, nearly half of these courts would never refer a case again unless one of these Euro lawyers showed up again. Now, one of the ways that Euro lawyers achieved this remarkable outcome was by ghostwriting the national court referrals that most judges like the time, the expertise, and quite frankly, the interest in drafting themselves. And here I just want to show you an archival example from a leading Euro lawyer in Paris, Lise funk -Bretano. She passed away in December 2020. She had a remarkable life as a Holocaust survivor. Happy to talk more about her in the Q&A. In this particular case, from 1978, challenging the restrictions on the export of milk into the UK, Lise uh, funk -Bretano was before the Commercial Court of Paris that had never before solicited the, the ECJ, and infamously, in a prior case, had even queried to the lawyers, what is this Treaty of Rome? We don't know what it even is. So Miss funk -Bretano decided to hold the judges by the hand and engage with what Euro lawyers repeatedly refer to as spoon feeding. She walked the judges through the A's, B's, and C's of the Treaty of Rome, including Article 177, establishing the preliminary reference procedure to explain how it empowers national judges to refer cases to the Court of Justice. And then she goes through to the exact questions that the judge could pose to the European Court, which the judge happily proceeded to copy verbatim without changing a word. And I repeatedly encountered this source of evidence in the archives and through fieldwork. Now, obviously, Euro lawyering didn't end in the 1980s. Instead, it underwent a gradual process of corporatization and a passage from political idealism to economic self-interest. The pioneers of Euro lawyering may have been motivated by this drive to construct Europe through law, but they invented a repertoire of strategic litigation that was modular. In other words, it could be co-opted by a rising network of corporate Euro firms. These Euro firms were largely absent before national courts before the 1980s because national restrictions on interfirm mergers, on the number of firm offices and such, retarded the corporatization of Euro lawyering. But as global comp competition pressures in the legal services market and the entry and lobbying efforts of Anglo-Saxon law firms chipped away at these restrictions, the rise of European big law began to take off. Here's a graph of the distribution across Italy, France, and Germany of branch offices of corporate law firms specializing in EU economic law, as ranked by two influential periodicals, Chambers Europe and the Legal 500. As you can see, particularly in the 1990s and early 2000s, the number of Euro firm branch offices proliferated in some cities. By paying high salaries and linking lawyers to deep pocketed clients willing to fund ambitious EU lawsuits and escapades to the ECJ, these corporate firms plucked aspiring EU law specialists from markets of less lesser centrality and forged a veritable corporate ecology of Euro lawyering. But not only that, these, Euro, uh, these corporate Euro firms increasingly became the transmission belt linking corporations to the ECJ. Here's what this looks like in a series of maps. In blue is the distribution of Euro firm branch offices across Italy, France, and Germany from the 1960s to, the, uh, to more recent years, larger dots, more Euro firms in those locations. And if we then superimpose some heat maps showing where national judges refer more cases to the ECJ in the areas of darker red, over time you can see a growing congruence with where these big law firms locate their branch offices. But here's the thing, these Euro firms are not just locating randomly. Overwhelmingly, the hotspots of these firms are wealthier global cities where lawyers can tap into hubs of financial services and transnational corporations. And if in fact we compare these hotspots to the cold spot locations where judges seldom refer cases to the ECJ, not only are these cities much more marginalized in the common market, but not a single Euro firm has opened an office in these sites. The rise of this uneven corporate ecology has a profound impact on the legal consciousness of practitioners on the ground. 
conditioning their capacity and willingness to mobilize EU law. In some places, EU legal mobilization is a daily affair, but in many others, EU law has remained a stubbornly distant abstraction. Take the view of a young lawyer in Palermo, one of the cold spots in my research, who got an MA in EU law and interned at the European Commission. When he then returned home with the ambition of becoming a practicing Euro lawyer, he realized he could not. He told me, quote, when you came back here, you felt strangely alone. You realized that here, as you spoke to friends and lawyers, you were a sort of extraterrestrial. When I joined the Palermo Bar, my sister gifted me some business cards that read, lawyers specializing in European law. And if I handed out those business cards, I would have never been able to work in Palermo again because people would say, all right, he does international law. What the heck is he doing here? Now compare this to a corporate law Euro lawyer in Paris who concluded our interview intent on emphasizing the incestuous micro world in which he became embedded and how it wouldn't be possible to become embedded in this world, but in a rich global city. He told me, quote, EU litigation is lengthy and it's costly. It takes years and it's very expensive. So who can pay for this? It's the big businesses and this matters too. So most lawyers will say, I'm going to go to a law firm that will value my experiences and my training. I'm going to Paris or London. Here in Paris, there's a part of the bar who are really knowledgeable of EU law. And I haven't seen this so much elsewhere, this incestuous aspect, because in truth, the judges, the lawyers, and those who are judged, that is the in-house counsel of the big businesses, they frequently meet up with each other. After the hearings, they go to dinner together. Sociologically, it's a micro world. Now, this uneven process of corporatization has some significant consequences. It means that instead of the personal uh, political idealism of lawyers being the fuel behind the judicial construction of Europe, increasingly it's the economic self-interest of corporate firms that determines where EU law is mobilized. It means that instead of Euro lawyers engaging in a kind of 360 degree political lawyering, where it's not the sector of a lawsuit that matters, but its capacity to advance European integration, we increasingly see a form of specialized economic lawyering focused primarily in areas like competition law and intellectual property law, where it's not always about promoting European integration. Sometimes it's about protecting these corporations from the reach of EU law. And it, this creates also sharper inequalities and in access to EU justice. Because if Euro lawyers flock to corporate firms in global cities, that will deplete more marginalized communities of the legal expertise that they absolutely need if they stand any chance of availing themselves of European law before national courts. Now, this kind of form of partial market capture, is this destiny for Euro lawyering? And my hope is that the answer is no, because the EU legal order is currently being shaken by an earthquake. And this is sort of my closing remarks. This, is, this earthquake, of course, is the constitutional breakdown and an autocratization of some member states like Poland and Hungary. I know many of us are still trying to come to terms with the wholly unprecedented ruling of the politically captured Polish constitutional tribunal this week. So my hope is that this veritable rule of law crisis will provide aspiring Euro lawyers with a new raison d'etre that is uncoupled from the imperatives uh, of the market. Europe has a resurgent need for Euro lawyers willing to defend targets of state repression and capable of publicizing gross violations of EU rights. Similarly, Europe increasingly needs Euro lawyers willing to supply legal expertise to transnational NGOs fighting for democracy and the rule of law. And EU institutions, especially the Commission, direly need rapid legal analyses that can cut through the fog of state disinformation supplied by recalcitrant member states. In other words, my hope is that the rule of law crisis in Europe spurs a third wave of Euro lawyering, one that instead of serving the market will increasingly try to reclaim that elusive, fragile, but all important liberal promise, promise of the judicial construction of Europe. And uh, those are my remarks. I very much look forward to, uh, to our discussion. Thank you. Many thanks to Mazo for this fascinating presentation. So we see many points in common with Lola. That's wonderful. The two presentations, I think, complete each other very well. And also you gave the perfect 
Hook to Lamine's presentation because you called to your lawyer to act in defense of the rule of law. And actually, Lamine is going to focus on pro bono lawyers. So that's the perfect, I think, connection between your speeches. I'm going to uh, introduce to you Lamine, which is a great pleasure to have here back at AUI. Of course, um, Lamine Kadar is the pro bono and diversity manager for Dance in Europe. He received his PhD from the EUI with a doctoral thesis on the impact of legal clinics and pro bono law firms on access to justice in Europe. So as you see, a very topical uh, topic. Lamine is also a global adjunct professor of law at New York University in Paris, where he teaches European public interest law. So we have finally the voice of a lawyer among us. So very welcome, Lamine, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just confirming you can, you can hear me well. Yep. Yes, okay. we do. And, and we can you... also see your slides. Yes. Excellent. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, indeed, um, I will not go further into my title, but I'm going to be presenting on pro bono and legal mobilization within the EU um, and beyond. Um, so let's start. I'm just going to jump right in. Let's start with, um, with, some, with some definitions. Uh, the first one being, uh, what is pro bono? Um, since that's what I'm talking about. Um, so pro bono, what I mean by that is the provision of legal services at no or low cost um, with no expectation of remuneration for recipients who cannot afford to pay for such services on the open market. So essentially, we're talking about um, legal volunteerism here. Um, now, there have been various uh, sort of rationales or normative justifications for legal volunteerism throughout European history, from civic duty in ancient Athens to Christian duty or Prodeo in the Middle Ages, uh, professional obligation um, as, um, as encouraged by lawyers, guilds, um, and, and bar associations in the early modern and modern eras, and today even corporate responsibility um, and charity. Um, but what is big law pro bono? Because that's what I'm really interested in talking about today. Um, well, it's the organized provision of pro bono, as I previously defined it, but by large commercial law firms, um, those very commercial law firms that Tomasa was just talking about, um, uh, that is with hundreds or thousands of lawyers across uh, large uh, European capitals primarily, um, and usually international, um, so spreading well beyond Europe as well. Um, so my basic claim uh, today uh, is that commercial law firms have established big law pro bono as a standard component of NGO or civil society legal mobilization uh, in Europe. Um, and when I say in Europe, I primarily mean sort of within the EU system and within the Council of Europe as well. Um, and when I say a standard component, I don't mean by any means that it's the driving force behind NGO or civil society legal mobilization. I think that is certainly not the case. Um, and I don't mean that um, you will find, uh, you will find uh, the imprint of Bigelow Pro Bono in every single um, uh, example of NGO civil society legal mobilization, but rather um, that you will find its imprint in the majority of times in one way or another at some point within a legal mobilization campaign. Um, and it has certainly become a standard tool to which NGOs and civil society can turn when engaging in and developing legal mobilization campaigns within Europe. So let's start um, with some very brief history. Um, so Big Law Pro Bono was basically born in the United States um, in the 1960s really, um, under the Johnson administration. Um, and this is in the, in the broader context of the American civil, uh, civil, um, uh, civil rights movement and uh, the public interest law movement that was a part of that. Um, and specifically the, the poverty law movement. And what happened was that um, there were a number of uh, commercial law firms who increasingly became concerned that they were losing out on their um, traditional talent pool being the elite lawyers from Ivy League law schools, who increasingly were drawn to careers in public interest law organizations, um, many of which were, were funded by the Ford Foundation um, and other philanthropic organizations in the US to try and deploy law as a tool to uh, bring about social transformation, in particular, eradicating poverty. Um, but what happened is that between the, the 1960s and the 1990s, what started out as kind of ad hoc uh, kind of pro bono programs set up by commercial law firms to attract top talent, eventually transformed um, uh, for a number of reasons, most notably the decimation of the uh, US federal civil 
uh, legal aid system in terms of the amount of funding going in um, and the advocacy of the American Bar Association. But essentially what happened was that these, these pro bono programs became fully institutionalized in, insofar as they had a formal pro bono policy. Um, they had a pro bono manager who was paid to manage a structured pro bono program, a pro bono committee, um, and, a, and a range of, uh, of mechanisms for handling clients in the same way as, as commercial clients would be handled. Um, so before we come to kind of big law pro bono in Europe and how it gets to Europe, I wanna very briefly touch upon two uh, histories or two ways you could look at the history of legal volunteerism um, in Europe. One focused on sort of more uh, procedural justice, access to justice, meaning access to, um, to lawyers and access to the uh, administration of justice. Um, and the second, more substantive justice, so focused on um, changing the status quo um, and more sort of political um, uh, and social causes. Um, so very briefly, legal voluntarism uh, oriented toward access to justice in Europe. Well, this is a kind of uh, a legal voluntarism, which really, you can go all the way back to ancient Athens and anywhere where you have within Europe and pretty much anywhere on the continent, where you have an organized uh, legal system, which is sufficiently sophisticated that individuals are no longer able to represent their own interests and uh, which is often monetized, you will find examples of pro bono. Um, that is uh, lawyers self-organizing from within various different practice sites, whether it's uh, bar associations, whether it's law firms, whether it's um, the law schools, uh, but you find lawyers self-organizing to solve the problem of procedural access to justice. Um, and you have some wonderful examples um, uh, that, that have been documented through various studies uh, carried out, including um, by the League of Nations in the 1920s, um, showing that there was pro bono practice in every single part of Europe, from Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Southern Europe, you had lawyers self-organizing and trying to solve this problem, which eventually was solved to some extent by the introduction of the welfare state and, and um, uh, legal aid systems after the Second World War, um, and in Central and Eastern Europe, after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, um, kind of a replication of the model um, in Western Europe. Um, so that's one way of looking at the history of legal volunteerism in Europe. The other way of looking at it is to look at a kind of focus on um, substantive, uh, uh, substantive justice, um, a more explicitly political form of legal volunteerism, which goes all the way back to um, the abolitionist movement um, and the fight against fascism in the 1930s, um, and the international human rights movement, organizations like Amnesty International, and then after the fall of, uh, the, well, before the fall of the Berlin Wall and after um, the, the dissident movements, which became international human rights movements, which sub subsequently became public interest law uh, or le explicitly legal um, uh, movements. Um, and here again, you find lawyers um, volunteering, again here, playing less of a leading role as in the kind of legal aid, um, uh, as, as in the kind of uh, legal aid oriented um, legal volunteerism, but now playing more of a bit role, supporting civil society campaigns. So let's look at where we are uh, today, um, Big Law Pro Bono in, in, in Europe. So, um, and, and, and also kind of how and why Big Law Pro Bono emerges in Europe. So today we have, um, these are approximation based on some recent studies um, that have been carried out, um, some surveys that have been carried out, including some of my own research, but we have around 7,000, uh, approximately 7,000 lawyers doing Pro Bono among the top 40 commercial uh, law firms, and this is based on a 30% participation rate, because obviously not every lawyer in every commercial law firm does pro bono, um, but um, on average, around 30% do um, uh, engage in pro bono, and an average of 20 hours per lawyer per year um, across all lawyers at the top 40 firms. That these are, this is from 2020, these, uh, these numbers, um, and then around 250,000 um, hours among the top 40 firms. So somewhere in the region of, these are not precise numbers, and there, there's, there's questions with some, you know, the, the, the accuracy of some of this data, but somewhere in the region of 75 million uh, euros um, per year. So it's not enormous, but it's not, in, it's not insignificant either. Um, so how did we get to this, to this uh, state of affairs? Well, it, it was a very much um, a, 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 it was very much not an organic process. It was very much an engineered transplant process. Essentially, as um, Tommaso was talking about how there was an internationalization and Europeanization of large commercial law firms, in that very same period between the 1980s and the early 2000s, um, there was two kind of trends going on. Uh, one was that um, these large uh, firms were opening up offices and capitals all across Europe, um, and they were bringing with them 
their culture of pro bono, which had been developed in the 1960s and 70s in the US. Um, and so they had pro bono managers who were hired um, and they had policies that said, listen, if we have our lawyers in Los Angeles and Chicago required to do 50 hours of pro bono, well, then we need to have our lawyers in Berlin and Prague and Budapest also doing 50 hours of pro bono every year. Um, but unlike in the US, this wasn't supported by a poverty law movement. So there wasn't a range of institutions and organizations established to connect the supply, the lawyers wanting to volunteer with the demand. Um, and so the pro bono managers had to construct, create, identify demand within Europe, um, which was a challenge because most of them were operating from the US. Um, but the second trend that had been going on in the same period was a US foundation funded uh, European public interest law movement, um, which was led by the likes of the Open Society Institute and the Ford Foundation, which essentially was about working with the dissident organizations in Central Eastern Europe, the human rights organizations that now after the fall of the Berlin Wall could go above ground and funding, spending millions of dollars to basically explicitly equip those organizations to engage, engage in legal strategies before um, the European courts and national courts with the objective of basically domesticating international, the international human rights movement within the new European democracies. Um, and so pro bono, big law pro bono fortuitously came about through the connection of these two trends. The enormous supply and number of pro bono managers looking for you know, demand um, and then, uh, through a, a few key civil society organizations, PillNet being the kind of um, the, the main arm of Ford Foundation Open Society for equipping these, uh, civil, these human rights organizations with legal skills. PillNet basically became a clearinghouse connecting on the one hand, uh, the commercial law firms to the civil society organizations. And so some of the first big law pro bono matters that we see in Europe were for the likes of the Polish Helsinki Foundation and a number of other similar human rights organizations operating in Central and Eastern Europe. And then over the years, what's happened is we have copycat clearinghouses. So again, these are organizations connecting legal volunteers at commercial law firms to civil society nonprofit organizations in Europe. We have these copycat clearinghouses emerging right across Europe to the point today where we have them in pretty much every European capital, you will find some form of clearinghouse playing this role. Um, and th th this data is a bit old, it's from my PhD research, it needs to be updated, but still today, somewhere in the region of 70% uh, of the beneficiaries of pro bono in Europe are uh, civil society organizations. And there are very long, uh, complicated reasons for why that's the case, but I won't go into those now. 31%, um, uh, this, is, this, is this is some more data from uh, a survey that I carried out during the course of my PhD together with another organization I was working with called the Good Lobby of 100 NGO advocacy organizations um, operating within the EU space. Um, just 31% of those had lawyers on staff. 54% um, of those NGOs were already in 2016 making use of uh, pro bono. And I think that that number would be higher if we were to do the survey again today. Um, uh, and, and again, 88 of those, uh, of those um, nonprofit organizations explicitly saying that EU law was an area, uh, was a jurisdiction in which they required pro bono services in relation to. So um, to, to kind of move towards my conclusion now, um, I'm just gonna conclude by kind of giving some examples of, of how this works today. Um, I think I've kind of illustrated the history and how this kind of came about, but just to give you some examples that uh, to, to kind of bolster my claim, um, the main types of pro bono support that are provided by uh, big law firms today, um, it, it really varies. So it can be corporate support um, for NGOs, which has taken on extra significance um, with the closing civic space with NGOs needing to sometimes relocate or have staff employed in different locations. So it's things like employment contracts, data protection, basic contracting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Legal needs that an NGO has vis-a-vis -vis its existence as a legal entity. Then comparative legal research. I mean, when you have a law firm like mine, which has you know, 29 locations across Europe, if you're trying to engage in legal advocacy before the European institutions, having access to that kind of breadth of coverage um, can come in very handy and it's something that you certainly would, would, would struggle to, to afford as an, as an NGO um, and procure on the open market. Um, domestic and European uh, and international litigation, lobbying and advocacy support. These are all ways in which um, commercial law firms are providing support to nonprofits. And I've got some, a range of examples, generic examples from the LGBT plus um, advocacy um, 
uh, uh, organizations um, that pro bono firms work with across uh, across Europe. And you can see that at pretty much every point within the legal mobilization campaign, um, there will be an opportunity for a law firm to be involved from um, providing uh, support to facilitate with the incorporation of NGOs and basic, all the kind of basic corporate um, legal advice that I mentioned before, um, you know, hiring of, of staff and so on, um, providing support to undertake domestic litigation. Um, so I've seen lots of examples of NGOs getting involved at the domestic level to actually bring claims before the, the national courts as a first step. Um, uh, getting involved um, in engaging in comparative legal research to bolster argumentation uh, before constitutional courts and trying to provoke um, a preliminary ruling to the CJEU, um, getting involved in actually developing argumentation or delivering oral argumentation before the CJEU. Um, all of that you know, expertise that has been developed as Tommaso kind of uh, eloquently um, explained in his own presentation is being deployed by commercial law firms to facilitate um, civil society um, advocacy. And of course, this also spreads into the uh, Council of Europe um, advocacy as well, um, and also continues post-judgment um, into kind of looking at issues around implementation. The most famous recent example um, is, of course, the Komen case, um, which uh, involved um, a number of commercial law firms, including White and Case, um, and has seen commercial law firms continue to be involved with a network, a dense network of uh, civil society organizations, LGBT rights organizations, working at both the international level, domestic level, working together with academic institutions and commercial law firms playing a, a bit role in this larger advocacy campaign. Um, so I'll stop there because um, I think I'm over time. Um, I know I haven't been able to go into as much detail certainly as I would like, but hopefully I've given you a flavor of, uh, of what I'm, of what I'm uh, talking about here. Many thanks, Ramin. This, is, this was another terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it also. It, it gives us, a, I mean, it's also connects to the next panel, which will focus on indeed NGO legal activism. It keeps coming back this theme about how do you meet societal demands with lawyers actually with Euro expertise. This, this was really fascinating. Um, now I'm gonna leave the floor to our discussant, Professor Antoine Vaucher. Uh, Antoine Vaucher is a research professor at the University Paris en Sorbonne, precisely at the Centre Européen de Sociologie et des Sciences Politiques. And he is a permanent visiting professor at i in Copenhagen. He was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the American Bar Foundation, a Marie Curie fellow at the Robert Schumann Center, and a Fernand Brodel fellow here at the UI. He's the author of many works that research the interaction between expertise and legal expertise and transnational politics, among which I will just cite the brokering euro, euro lawyers and the making of a transnational polity, because maybe it is the most relevant for this panel. Uh, thanks, Antoine, for being here and for acting as discussed, and the floor is yours. Hello, do you hear me well? Yeah, okay, yes. very good. Um, well, uh, thanks for, um, for having me to this uh, wonderful discussion this afternoon and um, and, and, and I'm, I feel like a very blessed discussion because the three papers, as you've been saying, Virginia, uh, fit very well together. I think they, I mean, first of all, they're all about lawyers. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite rare in a sense. Um, uh, and, 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 and they show also, I mean, uh, the, mature, the progressive maturity of a field of research, I think, that brings back uh, the actors of law in practice um, in, you know, when we study the transformations of, uh, of law in Europe or the transformations of uh, European law. And um, they not only, you know, get into studying the lawyers, the actors, but also somehow they showed difference. They show that, you know, there's not just one type of lawyers, um, one Euro lawyer, but there are historical transformations in the way the role of being a practicing law in Europe or the role of Euro law practice practitioner uh, is defined. So they showed historical transformations. And I think this is this is also a common point of the three uh, papers. They are very much historical, though they're written by non-historians. Um, uh, and they're also very comparative. Uh, they show difference across countries. And, and, and this is very original also, very nice, nicely done as well, but original in the sense that, again, 
um, you know, up until now, the story about you, the, 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 tra the trajectory of EU law was very much a story about supranational actors. Um, here we see the national roots, the, nat the, the national um, um, background, if you want, um, in which EU law has prospered. And we understand that much of the transnational transformations are actually rooted in national professional logics, uh, national histories of the legal fields. I think it comes out very well across the three papers from the very early uh, Euro lawyers described by Lola and also by Tommaso to also uh, the uh, to Lamine's paper and the way uh, pro bono was somehow uh, inserted into uh, uh, the European legal fields. I mean, the variety um, of the. So what we come up with uh, is, I think, a variety of national ways of European law, um, uh, which is itself is is very is very it's very much of a result, I think, already. Uh, but not only do we find that you know a variety of national stories that you could also have thought that there was this, but we see. Um, the gravitational pool, I think, as at some point Tomaso used that, um, of, of our, I mean, of course, of the EU, uh, in Lamine's paper, the gravitational pool uh, that drives these national stories is not the EU, but it's, it's more, um, you know, the, the big law firms of, uh, of Wall Street uh, and of London. Um, and you see, you know, the variety of ways through which um, um, these uh, national legal fields uh, negotiate, you know, this uh, gravita gravitational pool of uh, Brussels or of London and New York, and how uh, uh, that that can be also enlightening, in, you know, in in the particular uh, the, the specificities that we find. Um, and also, they're not only national stories, not only because of the great gravitational pull, uh, but also because they're, they're also uh, stories, as, as Tommaso shows very well in his paper, of polarities within national stories, um, within national fields. And, and, and you know, the, the way you, you map out the sort of uh, hot spots, the cold spots, of EU law um, is very um, also uh, enlightening, I think, uh, in, 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 in showing some sort of homology across national stories. You know, in a way, we find the same pattern uh, across member states uh, with this sort of uh, strong polarization of the practice of EU law. So I don't want to make too many general uh, remarks, but I wanted to point out to, I mean, not only to the fact that the papers talk to each other very well, very, I mean, and, you know, to a point that maybe they would deserve some sort of special issue or some sort of, you know, um, formalization of this story that they're writing all together. Um, but, uh, but also because I think it's, uh, again, the, it shows the, 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 the maturity of, of the field. I mean, and, and I'm saying that also in terms of methodologies as you, you have seen, you know, the variety of sources, archives, statistics, interviews, uh, and, 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 uh, and so on. Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to go more into that. I could say a lot more uh, in, the, in praise of the papers, but I'm gonna uh, spend more time on, on raising some, some questions to each one of the paper presenters. Um, of course, I'm very familiar with Lola's work for, uh, we've been working together for uh, a number uh, of years, but of course I still have questions to ask to Lola. So I'm gonna come to, uh, to some of them. Um, I mean, I think in your paper, Lola, you show very well how, um, so EU law, EU lawyers and that group has, have managed to entrench professionally, institutionally in the policies in the standard operating system in a way of the EU in particular in its most crucial, the most supranational policy uh, competition 
policy. Um, and you show also very well, I think, that a, a new type of lawyer emerge, uh, emerges in Brussels that is not the traditional litigant that uh, was, you know, uh, of, of European um, countries uh, in majority. But uh, so the question, in a way, is um, how, I mean, the, is, is first of all about competitors, in a way. Um, you showed, uh, it seems in your account that there is no competitor and they're just, you know, of course, they, 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 they're not, they don't come out of nowhere, as you explained very well, these lawyers, they, they're very much positioned nationally. But it seems that as if they, they were taking this space that they just had to create and there was no problem. My question is, who were the, the, the professions resisting um, uh, this, um, this emergence even today? Who are the ones who are actually competing their, you know, claim that they can actually do lobbying, that they can be consultants, that they could, you know, the sort of um, um, multifacetous aspect of lawyering that you describe. So, uh, you know, who are the competitors today? And it seems to me that, uh, of course, the more the, the most the most contemporary moment um, uh, in which. Um, as you economists have come into the game um, in which uh, the field of public affairs is packed with actors in Brussels and professionals um, um, may actually be you know question a little bit um, this um, this uh, this monopoly um, in a way and also I, I would ask you also, in, in relation to what Lamine says about public interest and pro bono. So what is the relationship of these corporate lawyers with pro bono? Oh, not only with pro bono, with public interest in general. How do they build a discourse of themselves, for themselves, that, um, that is more general than just defending corporate interests? Or are they actually just um, uh, uh, not pr producing any form of pan-European discourse, um, you know, uh, so I'd I, I'm interested not in, you know, the opposition between idealism and corporatization, which in Tom's and in your paper come out strongly, but more in the blurring of the two. Uh, how can you be pan-European um, idealist at the same time as you define your client interest? And how do you build a, a discourse of a, a public interest while at the same time um, uh, defending uh, uh, corporate interests. I think for Lamine is also a question. Um, I will get back to this uh, later on. And um, maybe to, to Tom now, and in a way also to uh, Lola, um, I, about exactly that, about your narrative, the move from idealism to corporatism. Um, I have, you know, if I take Lola's account, it doesn't seem to be that they're only idealists. Uh, playing, uh, you know, the part of the, um, the pan-European cause. Um, I mean, they seem to be looking for business. I mean, uh, they seem to be marginal players in their own uh, profession. Uh, well, they have cosmopolitan capital to spend in a way. They, they're, you know, multilinguistic. They have uh, uh, international stories, even in, during the wars, et cetera. So they're probably more open-minded European wide, wide, but uh, wise, but but at the same time, um, they seem to me actually essentially uh, defending uh, corporate interests, and and I don't think they're actually defending any other type of interest in in the story. I mean, in this early year. So, how do you see very much this uh, opposition operating in concretely? I mean, I see the sort of ideal type, but. Um, um, Okay, so that, that that would be one question, and and, and about this sort of opposition uh, that you 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 create. Um, uh, my second point to Tom is, in a way, I I I think your own your maps and that are very convincing. I mean, and, and impressive. To way uh, in a way, I'm, I'm my question would be: To what extent is this polarization, geographical polarization, polarization, is specific of EU law? And to what extent would you find the same for corporate law or for law? I mean, I mean, I, I'm sure there is some difference, but can you elaborate on that? You know, 
if you, if you were to map out the, 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 the litigation of corporate law in France or in Germany, wouldn't you come out with the same map in the end with Hamburg, Munich, uh, um, etc. So um, th th that, is, um, that, that is one thing. And, and, and another question would be, in, in a way, part of the story uh, of EU law, it seems to me, in terms of litigation, is also, and that gets to Lamine's in a way paper, uh, but is, is also the involvement of, uh, prof I mean, of NGOs, of professors, of law professors, who actually, in a way, um, fill in the void, if you want, or fill in the fact that, you know, uh, lawyers are, um, don't find it interesting or don't find it, uh, uh, or find it too costly or too long or too complicated to engage in EU law. And at some point, when you get into the field of migration law, asylum law, and uh, you know, law of poor clientele, of, of clientels that are poor, economically speaking, at this point, you see uh, a, a, um, a supply coming. The legal supply comes from elsewhere. And in the way, my question is, um, by looking at law firms, don't you, don't you miss part uh, uh, of the story of litigation, which um, is actually the story uh, of um, uh, you know, other players coming in that, that are actually um, um, uh, interesting because they have a long-term interest in EU law. They're typically, typically the, the repeat players. They have an interest in the transformation of EU law, in the defense uh, of public interest in EU law, et cetera. So, um, my question is, in a way, wh why, where are these players in your, and how can you, they fit in, in your, even, even geographically speaking, uh, in your story? Um, and then to Lamine's, I don't, um, if I still have a couple of minutes to uh, raise questions. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a fascinating story, and I'm, it's very refined, and I very much like the way you. You, you, you account for the specificities of, Europe, of, of pro bono in Europe through the, this whole story of how they get into a field that has a long history, legal professions being very much um, you know, proud of their story of being disinteresse, disinterestedness, um, and, in, and, in, in, and in defending the poor, um, as they would say, or defending uh, the public. Uh, beyond, um, you know, the, the, the beyond money, I would say, beyond the, the capacity to pay, etc. So, uh, what I see less, in a way, in your paper, a little bit more maybe in the presentation, is the role. Um, I mean, I would say, I mean, it, well, first of first of all, what I see that not that much in your paper is um, the fact that. This pro bono, because it serves corporate interests or because it is develops within law, big law firms, can enter into conflict with corporate interests. Or at least there is, there is a sort of negotiation there. And firms tend, legal law firms tend to select the causes that they want to defend. Um, if they are too political, they won't actually take them. And my question in there is, in a context where human rights are becoming increasingly polemical, in Europe in particular, and, and, and that gets also to Tommaso, um, you know, uh, claim in the end to, that I share entirely. Um, well, then, how do law firms actually position themselves, you know, in a context where in which um, you know the, the the litigation becomes one of the place where political politics happen. So my, my question would be, you know, what about the selection of causes? What about the causes that are forgotten? Uh, what about the ones that are too polemical because it would, it would uh, uh, undermine the brand of the law firm? Um, and so in, in a way, uh, you know, the, the, these conflicts, are, are, I think, are very interesting uh, by themselves. Um, all the more so, I think, that you know, right wing or extreme right wing foundations and NGOs are also now entering the game or have entered the game for a couple of, you know, for a decade at least. And I like very much your very last points on 
you know, litigation in Strasbourg or in Luxembourg, but I, but there is a sort of counterpart that comes from particularly the United, you know, American philanthropy that are heavily subsidizing, I don't know, um, you know, about uh, uh, against sex, same-sex marriage, against uh, minority rights, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, the, the field is, is very co conflictual now and, 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 and difficult. So um, uh, that's with the last question, um, and I'm end up with that. Uh, so, you know, in a way to get to the loop to the loop in a way. So what about uh, pro bono in EU law firms? I mean, do you have, because you don't, uh, you don't give a specific role and, and, uh, to EU law firms, particularly, I don't know, in Brussels, uh, you don't really give an account of how pro bono enters the story of, um, of, of Tommaso and Lola. I mean, the story of Euro lawyers, not national uh, law um, uh, practitioners. And so is there something specific about the pro bono in Brussels? Um, uh, you know, uh, again, that's that's the, um, the story about how these euro lawyers build a, a public interest image of themselves. And uh, do you have an account of that uh, also? Voila, thanks for uh, your attention. Many thanks, Antoine. That was great, a really brilliant comment and insight. I think you stimulated greatly the discussion. I now have like tons of questions to ask, a very little time, so I'm very conflicted myself. Um, but I will not abuse my position um, as chair of this panel. And I know that we have a question from Amedeo, and I can see that Chris. Uh, just wrote in the chat another question. So um, I would inv invite the audience, please, to just uh, raise your hand or, or write in the chat if you want to ask a question. You, you can, of course, just, just speak or write down your question. I will give the floor to Amedeo now for his question. Thank you very much, Virginia. Uh, I was uh, fascinated by uh, all the talks, but uh, I have to admit, uh, in particular, the one by Lola, because she, she brought back to memory my first love, that is antitrust law. That's how I started. And uh, what the impression at the time was that antitrust law was a very specialized uh, kind of uh, field domain, so lawyers would only do competition law, and uh, sometimes the connection with more institutional aspects would not be so evident. But in fact, they are. So Bosch apparently was a competition law case, and uh, uh, and of course uh, I think it's no coincidence that constitutional provisions that sorry that um, antitrust provisions have constitutional status in EU law, uh, which is an interesting difference vis-a-vis vis-a-vis um, uh, vis antitrust law. But um, my question is um, relates more to another intuition. Uh, so the, uh, I had concern the style of lawyers. So so at the courts they employ this category at the macro level to describe the style of common lawyer, lawyer, the style, the style of civil law lawyer. I wonder whether it also applies uh, at, uh, well, something that is between the individual level and the micro level. So for example, it has been contended that Trabucchi um, uh, steered the majority in favor of direct effect because he was an expert in private law. So I had a certain mindset that had a certain attention for the right of individuals. Uh, then another uh, claim that has been made is that uh, the international law mindset was, of course, a bit different. So, for example, that's what I what I argued before. Sendardi was a game changer because it brought a constitutional law mindset to the game. What about the competition law mindset? What do you think are the distinctive features of this category, and how do you think they contributed to European integration? Thanks. Many thanks, Amadeo, for this question. So I will just read out loud uh, Chris' question, if if she doesn't mind. So um, she says uh, she's based in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and she uh, uh, addresses this question to Lamine. In fact, who is also based in the Netherlands. So uh, I think we come back to the national context here. So I know little about pro bono practice throughout Europe, but I am aware of the Dutch context. I think you know pro bono connect. And I would argue that the lawyers there are more instrumental to legal mobilization as opposed to full-fledged actors and euro lawyers, as they are more deployed by the NGOs, civil society, and not independent actors themselves. Do you agree, or would you argue that they are more like the lawyers described in the first two presentations? So again, a question very much on, on this link between um, the societal demands and the lawyers. I'm also very intrigued by uh, Antoine's point of whether there is a conflict indeed between the corporate interests and, and the public law. I was thinking about 
you know, trade unions, for instance, we don't have so many trade union cases before. I mean, we do have some, but not as many as we would expect. So there might be a filter. Okay, I'm just in, intruding into another question. Sorry, uh, I, we have another question from Mario. Yes, thank you very much, Virginia. I have a question actually for both uh, Tommaso and Lamine. It's a, just, just a, a curiosity that I have on actually the social classes, if we can call them like that, the social classes uh, to which uh, many plaintiffs belong. If you noticed um, a change in the trajectory, basically an evolution in the social classes to which many plaintiffs belonged uh, in, in different cases across the history of, uh, the history of EU, uh, EU law mobilization. Um, in the first panel, Karin was talking about businesses being affected by the, the treaties of Rome and therefore mobilizing the court, some sort of elitist, um, elitist use of, of EU law. But then um, um, in, the, in the second panel, Tommaso was talking about this ghostwriting model that is particularly fascinated, where basically are not clients choosing lawyers, but actually the opposite, Laws, lawyers basically selecting some some plaintiff, their plaintiffs basically. And therefore I was wondering, where does the, the resources to bring cases then come from? Because if there are clients choosing lawyers, I would argue probably clients are also providing the economic resources for bringing cases. But when there are lawyers choosing clients and plaintiffs, where does the money come from from bringing the case? Are we also talking about, and, and here we comes basically to the pro bono as, aspect of, uh, finding resources, and this is also why I'm addressing this question also to Lamine, uh, is basically the pro bono um, practice in many different uh, law, firms, law firms changing uh, the landscape of, uh, of the social classes to which some plaintiffs belong? I hope the question is clear enough. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Mario. Yes, to, to me, it was clear and very topical question. Uh, okay, we have nine minutes, so <laughs> three minutes for each speaker just to try to address this. It, it's just an, a mission impossible, I know. Um, and sorry for being a bit late with the, with the program. So I just, without further ado, I, I give the floor to Lola again. Thank you, and thank you for all your comments and questions. Um, I'm going to try to reply very quickly. So about the competitors, um, competitors, yes, they have competitors. And actually, we've seen one of them uh, during my presentation when I talked about the AMNS case, and I said it was in, in guaranteeing legal privilege for lawyers, but independent lawyers. And the you know, Code of Justice specified independent lawyers, which triggered also uh, some criticism from the UK because in-house lawyers wanted also to uh, have this legal privilege to, uh, they, I would say that the Euro lawyers got rid of the in-house lawyers at that time, um, but because it, yeah, it was really more interesting for a company to go to a private uh, law firm because it would uh, guarantee the, the legal privilege. Um, other competitors arose of also uh, after as the Euro lawyers, the lawyers were developing their competencies and for example, uh, about lobbying, of course, uh, uh, they developed a, a public affairs department at the end of the 90s, etc. especially in Brussels. Here they have direct competitors um, with the lobbying consultancy firms. Uh, and uh, they also have an advantage because of this specific legal privilege. They don't have to disclose their clients and their activities in the transparency register. So they also have an advantage in this, uh, I would say, in this, uh, in this, um, on this issue. And uh, I'm working Working with Emilia Cocao, which is who is in the online room, I think on this uh, on this question. Um, but also, I want to talk about third uh, uh, category of uh, competitors. We are the economic consultancy, and here we can link it with the. It's a little bit an effect, a boomerang effect, <laughs> because uh, very pr practitioners participated and mobilized for the creation of the court of first inst instance, saying that we needed more legal economic expertise and actually it succeeded but now they need economic consultants uh, to deal with the competition cases and uh, this kind of consultancy are really um, uh, blooming uh, in Brussels uh, and so, so now they have to deal with uh, this kind of lies competitors in competition cases. A, th a fourth perhaps example is the big four and here I've recently worked on the financial regulation uh, after 2008 and how these big four were consultancy uh, they have uh, actually very much uh, took upon the legal advice on financial regulation and uh, private practitioners and euro lawyers here are losing uh, the competition on this.
this kind of legal service. Um, I have two other set of questions, but uh, about the, the private lawyers and uh, public interest. I was very surprised, naively, I was thinking uh, when I started my PhD that I would find um, a very uh, much, uh, much more important involvement into the European Union. I don't know, like, like membership to the FIDE or to the Mouvement Européen, or none of my <laughs> Euro lawyers from the 60s, 70s are actually involved uh, or taking stands, uh, normative bias for European integration so that would uh, clearly I would say uh, go into Tom's direction when it said that uh, corporate interests uh, were perhaps more important um, but what I can say about the public interest is that you have this repertoire action of defending the rule of law defending uh, the rights of the defense uh, and this is a repertoire that has been used many times uh, uh, not only for breaking in into the, the competition policies, but also now, as I said, to uh, avoid being in the transparency register. So this repertoire can be also a little bit um, misused by business lawyers uh, to uh, gain uh, advantage also as intermediaries uh, between companies and uh, EU institutions. Um, I will perhaps finish it <laughs> here. Amedeo, your question is very interesting. I would need I think a few hours to <laughs> reflect on it uh, perhaps just a paradox that is uh, we're talking about administrative uh, uh, at the beginning administ an administrative procedure we would we could have thought that public law public lawyers would have been interested in this administrative law I think the reason why private practitioners private law lawyers really uh, took upon this uh, question is because they were more equipped to go internationally uh, than pu national public lawyers that would be just thank you. that's a very interesting good point okay thanks lola i know it's it's an impossible task right so tom choose three minutes to you too thanks a lot thank you virginia and uh, antoine uh, great comments uh, i want to sort of take uh, the main comment in some sense head on um, is there a conflict between idealism and the corporatization of euro lawyering and as you said you know euro lawyers are a diverse group and i did meet some corporate euro lawyers who um, didn't feel like there was a conflict between them working in a big law firm and their kind of pro-european idealism but i think overwhelmingly the sense that i got was that there was a significant tension here's one historical puzzle that i think illustrates this all of the leading Euro lawyers in the 1960s and 1970s, with one or two exceptions, but almost all of them, never joined a big law firm when the opportunity presented itself. And why is that? It was because they didn't see themselves as corporate lawyers. They were just as happy representing you know, a farmer in Puglia as they were a multinational corporation in Milan. Uh, but they realized that if they joined a corporate law firm, um, that would narrow the political lawyering that they wanted and the interests of profitability of being able to charge bigger legal fees and such would um, constrain their ability to take on test cases that could advance European integration, even if they were not money makers. And on the flip side, I met several um, uh, Euro lawyers uh, who resigned from big law firms and took massive pay cuts and became judges because they were frustrated by the lawsuits that they were being forced to take in a corporate law firm. And their Euro expertise was as often being deployed to shield their corporate clients from the reach of EU law, from the reach of the commission, from the court of justice, as it was to actually mobilize European law and advance European integration. And they were willing to take massive pay cuts in order to leave that sphere and uh, in, in their view, become more in, uh, in, in line with their kind of European idealism. So there's this kind of bind whereby an idealistic Euro lawyer nowadays feels like they can't really make a living in a context like Palermo or Naples or Marseille, where you could really advance consumer protections, environmental protections, labor law, areas, places where you can really advance the public interest of marginalized communities. And at the same time, once they join a corporate law firm, they feel like increasingly they have to specialize in areas like competition, tax, and intellectual property law, which are not the areas of law that, uh, that appeal to those kind of uh, marginalized communities and sometimes to the public interest. So I think this is a real, this is a real challenge for the Euro lawyer nowadays. Can you be an idealistic Euro lawyer nowadays? I think it's really tough. Um, um, 
And part of this has to do with the geographies of corporate law litigation, which will be just as clustered in those global cities as um, uh, lawyering of competition law and such. Of course, that doesn't align with national litigation patterns. For instance, in Italy, Southern Italy tends to be much more litigious than Northern Italy. But if you look at EU lawsuits, predominantly they're concentrated in cities like, uh, like Milan. And the reason is because Euro lawyers increasingly conflate EU law with corporate law. Um, and finally, for Mario, uh, uh, the social class with which paleontists belong, this is a fascinating puzzle that I don't, I can, don't have a, a full answer to. Many of the early Euro lawyers took on lawsuits that were kind of economic losers. They would go out to the countryside and scout out some farmer who was willing to play along and a justice of the peace willing to refer a case. And they were willing to do it knowing that they weren't gonna make a lot of money. And I think part of it is because what was animating them was not the desire to make money. Of course, they needed to make a living so they'd still had to take on some corporate clients or maybe take a teaching gig at a university and such. But this desire to participate in constructing Europe through law this desire to challenge state law uh, and overturn national policies in the ECJ. Um, and I think that was enough to take on uh, and, uh, uh, cases that um, wouldn't have made them a lot of money. But where the alternative sources of financing came from is, is a puzzle that I haven't completely resolved yet. Thank you. Many thanks, Tom, also for, for being quick. And um, Lamine, now the floor is yours. Sure. Um, so a lot of questions. Um, I'll start with um, uh, the kind of question around the selection of cases. Um, I think, of course, it is uh, very true um, that law firms are playing an active role in selecting cases. Um, in principle, law firms will claim to be neutral, um, that they are only, um, uh, you know, provide filling a kind of procedural gap, providing access to justice. But of course, that is is kind of a um, um, you know <laughs> well a, a fiction essentially because ultimately they're working with and that's one of the things that's unique about pro bono in in Europe as compared to the U.S. is that ultimately many pro bono clients have ended up being quite um, you know aggressive um, uh, or uh, progressive aggressive however you want to call it civil society organizations that are really um, um, advanced and motivated and very well organized um, and falling at different places on, a, on the kind of political spectrum. Um, and so law firms inevitably end up getting involved in campaigns that are divisive, whether nationally or, or, or at the European level. Um, and you can see, I'll just to give you a very practical example, you know, we have uh, re most recently in, in just the last year or so, maybe two years, we've had lawyers, um, our lawyers um, at Denton's being attacked. Um, on social media for uh, work that we've done around trans transgender rights and work that we've done around migration in Poland in particular. Um, we've had right-wing advocacy groups coordinating campaigns to kind of drag the name of our firm through the press, um, uh, particularly in, in the UK. So, um, so it's, it's true that, uh, that, that, that you know, law firms are selecting and they, they can always hide behind rules around conflicts of interest or, or kind of extrapolating from that into sort of positional conflicts, business conflicts, which essentially mean the law firm taking the position that we don't think our clients are going to like it if we represent this, uh, this particular organization or are involved publicly in this particular campaign. But a lot happens off the record. We do an enormous amount of pro bono work that our name will never be associated with it, but we still do it. Um, we still take it on. Um, so I think, uh, I think you're right to point it out. And I think, I think it, is, it is a concern because there are certainly cases where there's just not interest um, for pro bono. And I sometimes worry about things like Roma rights and things like that, that are just not as popular as LGBT rights or environmental protection or children's rights. And I wonder, you know, what happens to those causes that are kind of, you know, forgotten and not, not popular. So I think it's, it's, it's a very important point. Um, and uh, ultimately, when you're relying on something that is provided by the private sector to provide a public good, there's a challenge there. Um, and I don't think there is a, an effective way of resolving that yet. Um, looking to the question from Chris um, about whether pro bono lawyers are kind of more playing an instrumental role. Yeah, I, I agree. I would agree with that. But I do think that by looking at the clearinghouses, the national clearinghouses, you are kind of looking only at, at the whole picture from one side. And so you're more likely to see lots of, you know, 
a much more in instrumental role because you're seeing the whole function of the clearinghouse is to take on individual requests from hundreds of NGOs and pass them on to lawyers. And in that case, it is going to be very instrumental in a very small role. But law firms, pro bono is, is tiered. And so you also have um, more strategic projects, long-term projects where law firms have a very close working relationship with a specific organization, an LGBT rights organization or a child rights organization that builds over many, many years and intensifies and deepens. And maybe lawyers sit on the boards of the NGO um, you know, maybe they go to the annual general meetings and, you know, these kind of relationships build over time um, and you get a much more, um, you get law firms playing a much more significant role. In particular, it depends also on the area of legal practice, the, the relevant firm, the relevant practice group within the firm. So in particular, constitutional lawyers, particularly at leading uh, constitutional law firms. Um, so we have a very varied practice, but in some of our offices, we will have leading constitutional lawyers within our firms. There you will have lawyers who are competent to play a leading role in a human rights campaign, right? Through in terms of strategic litigation. Um, but if you have an employment lawyer, then of course they're gonna be playing a much more bit role um, in terms of what you know, an NGO is doing. So it really, it, it, it's, it's, it varies basically. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna very briefly touch upon? Uh, so Brussels, is there something unique about sort of pro bono in Brussels and, and pro bono among Euro lawyers specifically? Well, I will just, I'll note that first of all, Brussels, um, has, I think, after London, the highest uh, numbers, number of, 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 in terms of the number of hours law firms at commercial law firms are doing on average, uh, pro bono hours law, lawyers are doing at commercial law firms on average per year. Um, and it is really after London, I would say the second sort of capital of pro bono. Um, and I think that's not by accident because of the presence of the EU institutions. Um, there are enormous issues around conflicts of interest, real issues around like actual legal conflicts um, with uh, Brussels-based pro bono because law, law firms very often will stand on the opposite side of the kind of hot topic issues around environmental law or agricultural law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are often challenges for law firms to get involved in that kind of work. But I would say there is emerging, it's still very early days. It took several decades for pro bono to really get fully fledged um, in the US and we're only into the first decade in Europe. Um, and so it's gonna take a while, but I would say that there is now an ecosystem in Brussels. There are lawyers um, putting their pro bono awards um, on, their, uh, on their websites, in their, in their communications to, law for, uh, to their clients and so on. And there is a kind of identity and um, uh, a kind of uh, self, uh, you know, self promotion around their public interest image that is happening slowly in Brussels, but it will still take several more years before we get there. Um, so yeah, I mean, not enough time to, I could go into more detail there, but I don't have enough time. Around the, the final thing, around the social class of the, um, of the um, beneficiaries, let's say, of, of pro bono, um, because initially um, the pro bono managers, they didn't have access to uh, marginalized individuals, to the poor, um, and they wanted it to be easy. It's one pro bono manager trying to provide pro bono matters for maybe 11 different offices, 11 different jurisdictions, you know, being in London while help trying to develop pro bono programs in Budapest, so, or New York or whatever. So um, they worked through intermediaries and these intermediaries were always elites. They were always legal elites, often US elites or European elites. Um, and so that is changing as pro bono starts to focus more in Europe. Um, okay, running out of time on individuals. Um, we, we're, we're moving more towards pro bono lawyers being directly connected to migrants and other different kinds of um, uh, lower income groups. I will stop there. Many thanks, Lamine, and sorry for cutting a bit shorter this panel. I hope the discussion can, can go on um, after the third panel and I will thank you all and just leave the, the chair of the next panel to Amedeo. Many thanks for this brilliant discussion. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thanks to all the participants so far. So as Shakespeare put it, what's past this prologue. So we heard about the origins of legal mobilization of community law. We heard, we learned how it developed. So let's see how legal mobilization works now. And maybe let's uh, also try to look at how it may, might develop in the future. We'll do so uh, in the current panel. Thanks to Mario Pagano and uh, Virginia Passaracqua. So um, I'll, I'll first introduce Virginia. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Utrecht Center for Regulation and Enforcement in Europe. 
research in the field of EU law, EU litigation, migration, and discrimination. Uh, and she has uh, studied in, in, in the law and context perspective. She investigated how social and political processes shape litigation at the EU level and vice versa. She examines the effects of EU law on social justice, redistribution, and minorities. She obtained a PhD from European University Institute in 2020, and she received the Mauro Capelletti Prize for Best UI Thesis on Comparative Law, and it has happened to be on legal mobilization of EU law. Uh, by the way, it was also the subject of a Common Market Law Review article that was published initially 58, uh, in issue three of volume 58 of 2021. So without any further ado, Virginia, you have the floor. Yes, many thanks and hello again uh, <laughs> with this other um, role. So uh, hello everybody again. So I'm gonna present um, a paper based on my dissertation that hopefully will become a book, Legal Mobilization via Preliminary Reference Insights from the Case of Migrant Rights. Um, so I want to start here just explaining that in the migration field, we saw a growing role of EU law and the Court of Justice in the last 20 or so years. Here you can see a figure that shows how there was a growing number of preliminary rulings by the Court of Justice in the field of migration. This grew exponentially from 2000, more or less, um, until today, and it's still growing. And, but what we see also from this figure, and this is part of the puzzle that I'm going to tackle today, is the fact that not all EU norms are mobilized in the same amount. So the preliminary reference to the Court of Justice tend to focus on some pieces of EU norms more than others. So we have pieces of legislation like, for instance, the Ankara Agreement about the status of Turkish migrants in the European Union, which is the norm that has been mobilized the most in the European Union before the Court of Justice. And then we have norms such as the Seasonal Worker Directive, for instance, that has never been mobilized before the European Court of Justice. So this investigation starts very much from this puzzle. Here you can see just a representation of the number of questions for each EU migration law. And the second part of the puzzle is that we see also a great variation in the country that make references. So here you can see the three case studies that I selected for my investigation that have very different rates of references in three different uh, migration law. Italy, UK, and the Netherlands present peaks in references on different migration, European migration law. Why this is a puzzle? Because actually, this is very much in conflict with many theories that try to explain cross-national variation of preliminary references, because this theory tells us that courts have a very uh, important role, so we have courts that are more proactive than others, higher courts tend to refer less than lower courts, or uh, countries that have a certain type of judicial review tend to be the country that refer the most and so on and so forth. So all these theories are based on courts and judicial culture cannot really explain this variation. What does explain this variation, I would argue today, is in part also cases of legal mobilization. So the fact that the EU law, this EU migration law, have been used by pro-migrants groups to actually improve the situation of migrants in the European Union. Um, what I argue is actually um, the my findings is divided into two. The first part of my finding is that Article 267, the preliminary ruling procedure, was used as a tool for contestation of national law. So here I come back to this um, understanding of the preliminary reference procedure as actually a tool for supranational judicial review and not very much as a tool for cooperation or interpretation of EU law. And this kind of, it, it's a very important um, game changer. And then I would argue that actually legal mobilization does not occur all the time. Of course, I, I found, thanks to my uh, investigation into three um, case studies that I mentioned before, I found the conditions that allow to understand when do we have legal mobilization for migrants' rights and, we, and when we do not have it. And in order to, to understand this, I relied to two concepts developed very much from the political science literature and the social movement literature that you can see here. The first is mobilization resources, and the second one is the legal opportunity structure. I will, of course, come back to this later. 
I won't, um, I won't explain um, a lot about the legal mobilization approach that I use. I just want to say that I use it in my research to indicate both an empirical phenomenon, so the use of law by collective actors to achieve a political goal that transcends the interest of the party, and, and also, and maybe most importantly, as, a, as an approach, a methodolo methodological approach. In fact, as Gallanter and Siemens said in the already in the 90s, courts are mainly, mainly reactive institutions that do not acquire cases on their own motion, but on only upon the initiative of one of the disputants. This is very much linked to what we already uh, said today, of course, to the role of the individuals, the role of, of the litigants uh, in, in order to determine the political uh, agenda of the courts. So the fundamental characteristic of this type of inquiry is that the court, the European Court of Justice is not more at the center of my analysis, but I will focus rather on the social and political context of the litigation. And in this case, in the social and political context of my three case studies. So just to go on with the puzzle, one could argue at this point of my presentation that actually we have very few cases brought by pro-migrant groups before the European Court of Justice. You do not see very often the name of pro-migrant NGOs uh, be, being part of a case before the court. So you might say that actually this kind of, of legal mobilization does not really exist on this very minimal. Indeed, we have in the literature accounts that describe the Court of Justice as hostile to collective actors. As Mario will explain later in, in, in his presentation, the Court of Justice is very difficult to reach for NGOs and public interest groups. So actually, that's the reason why we do not have many direct action before the Court of Justice and also because of structural obstacles, like the fact that they cannot file amicus courier or third party intervention. Indeed, you can see in this box that only the 4.8% of references in the migration field are brought by collective actors. You might remember the case of NS, maybe was one of the most famous uh, in the field of asylum. And when it comes to um, to the Court of Justice, you might ask, is it a lot? Is it a good, is it a big number, a low number? We can use as a reference the Equality Law in Europe database, which is the product of a research project conducted here at the EUI. They, um, they have this database online that show that in the anti-discrimination field, we have the double. So in the 11% of cases, we have NGOs and public interest group bringing litigation, which, which shows that this number is quite low in the migration field. And also, of course, if compared with the European Court of Human Rights, we might argue that this number is extremely low because before of the European Court of Human Rights, we have the presence of NGOs and public interest group, it's much bigger in the 20% of cases, uh, an application before the European Court of Human Rights is filed by a public interest group. Still, what I show with my research is that actually we have to scratch under the surface. So if, in, in the text of the judgment, we don't find any reference to public interest groups and NGOs. In reality, these groups do play a role in the litigation and do play a role in the preliminary reference. The fact is that they litigate not in their own name, but in the name of a private litigant, in the name of an individual migrant. So in most of the case, you will find the name of, of a migrant or the initials of a migrant as it happens in most of the case. And you have really to understand who is the lawyer and who brought the case in order to find out that in fact, behind that single individual litigant, there was a network of association or even just one association bringing the case with a strategic purpose. So how did I discover this uh, legal mobilization that was a little covered um, in the text? It was not evident from the text. I had to conduct interviews to study all the preliminary references. And that's why I selected Italy, UK, and the Netherlands, because there I had the highest chance to find these, these groups and these organizations based on the fact that Italy, UK, and the Netherlands had peaks in references, the one that I showed you at the beginning. So I interviewed the lawyers involved in the case, the judges and the NGOs in order to gather material and to answer to my question. Moreover, 
uh, as I said, I had to reconceptualize a bit the conceptual tools that I was using for the social movement fields, because I realized that actually EU litigation is a quite a specific field, both in terms of the procedure and also in terms of the actors that we say we see involved. So as I will show you um, later, I had to adjust this classical concept in order for them to fit, to make them fit with the specific 267 procedure. So let me explain you my findings. First of all, what I found is that behind the three peaks in reference, there was a contestation through preliminary reference. What does it mean? It means that these groups, these pro-migrant groups, use the Article 267, the preliminary reference procedure, in order to contest, to challenge a national law a national uh, provision of, of migration law. So as you can see here, this is the very much the idea of the preliminary reference being used as a citizen's infringement. So the infringement procedure of the European citizen. This was an idea that was first mentioned by Pescator and then um, kind of theorized more uh, by Bruno De Vitte. So in the three cases, you can see that in Italy, there was a legal mobilization of the return directive in order to contest the criminalization of migrants. In the UK, the mobilization was consisted in using EU citizenship norms in order to, again, challenge and contest the UK government restrictive stance towards family reunification. And finally, in the Netherlands, the family reunification directive was used in order to challenge a new integration policy that was adopted by the government. So I don't have time, of course, to go into the three cases, but what I want to uh, use is to use to do is to use the example of Italy just to um, give you some more context. So in Italy, in 2002, the Berlusconi II government criminalized illegal state with up to four years of detention. This is what is famous as the criminalization law. So the, the irregular status of migrants became a criminal offense. This meant, and this is important for what I will say later, that a lot of cases were kind of transferred from the administrative courts to the criminal courts. In 2005, the Italian Pro-Migrants Association tried to challenge this law before the Italian Constitutional Court but the Italian Constitutional Court rejected their claim in 2005. In 2008, there was a very important change in the law because the return directive was adopted and the Italian government decided not to transpose it because it deemed that the Italian legal system was already in line with the return directive. In 2010, after the, uh, the deadline for transposition expired of the return directive, we have the en masse legal mobilization of Italian judges. So as you can see, 16 judges from any level, from the Italian uh, Court of Cassation to the Giudice di Pace, decided to mobilize and to submit 22 preliminary reference to the Court of Justice, all with the same question. Is the Italian law in line with the EU law and with the return directive? So the result of these mass preliminary references was the case of Eldridi El Sagor that you might have heard about, which compelled the Italian government to reform immigration law. So here is just to give you one example. I will use this example to explain when do we have this type of legal mobilization happening? When do we have, uh, what are the conditions that explain the emergence of this type of legal mobilization? So first of all, and this is very much linked to what um, the previous panel uh, highlighted, resources. Resources are key to have legal mobilization. Migrants are, as Antoine actually said, resourceless type of litigants. They do not, in most of the cases, of course, there is a lot of variation, but in many cases, they do not have, they do not possess much financial resources. They do not possess much expertise on EU law most of them. So that means that they need to have allies in order to mobilize EU law. And that's why in the mobilization that I study, they, the cases were not, uh, the migrants did not play a much, uh, almost any role actually in the legal mobilization. They were kind of at the margin. Who conceived the legal mobilization, had the idea and promoted the mobilization were the lawyers. So here again, we see what Lola said, lawyers, that actually decide which kind of cases to bring to the court of justice. So it's not the demand that shapes what lawyers 
uh, bring to the court of justice, but the lawyers themselves that mounted the cases and decided to bring litigation before the court. The second type of resource that was very much important is Euro expertise. So I was struck by the fact that there was a huge amount of EU legal expertise provided uh, to feed these cases. So we, I, I saw the engagement of EU academics, uh, Euro lawyers, um, and also you know, NGO members and so on and so forth that became experts in EU law and provided the necessary know-how. It seemed very much that you cannot conceive a European strategy before the Court of Justice be without having this Euro expertise. I will give an example from Italy. In Italy, actually, the two, um, there was a very important academic article who shaped the debate and that paved the way to the rulings of Eldridi and Sagor and the author one of the authors of, of this academic paper was also the lawyer in the case that defended Mr. Eldredi and Mr. Sagor in front of the court. So you see an EU and an academic, not the EU law scholars, but an academic expert in EU law who played also the part of the lawyer in the case. Uh, the second condition that I want to draw your attention on is the legal opportunity structure. This is a concept that, as I said, comes from uh, social movement literature and looks at the structure in which movement uh, take action. So how do the, does the structure influence the litigation? So normally the legal opportunity structure third, takes the form of the legal stock, the rules to access to court and judicial receptivity. So what does the judge think about the litigation? But in the context of the preliminary reference procedure, we have to change a bit our view on the legal opportunity structure and to reframe it as an EU legal opportunity structure, which I argue is composed of two elements. The first is the fact that EU law must be perceived by the litigants, by the lawyers, as having a comparative advantage respect to national law. That means it, that if EU law doesn't have this comparative advantage, it will never be mobilized. And that does explain why only some EU um, laws get to be mobilized in course and others are just dead letter and they will never use just because it's not advantageous for the cause of the lawyers. I will be a bit quicker. Um, the second element of the EU legal opportunity structure is the national court. Here we do not really escape from the fact that the the uh, preliminary reference was conceived as a tool for cooperation between courts. So the domestic judge does have a lot of power in deciding which questions reach the Court of Justice and which do not. However, I do not want to overstate the role of the national judge because I want to say that actually pro-migrants movement, social movements do have an influence on the judge. As already Tommaso said, I saw many instances in which the text of the reference was written by the social movement and also in which by organizing conferences, by organizing events and demonstration, actually the, the pro-migrant groups could shape the idea of, of the judges and could shape their view about EU law and could convince them to make the reference. So again, here we have a kind of an interaction between these two. Okay, I have to conclude, and sorry if I've been too long. I just want to say that actually what, what this case shows, the case of migrants, is that actually we should have, um, have we should give uh, the importance that it deserves to the context and the political context of um, uh, preliminary references. And this is crucial to understand variation, um, cross-national variation of, of litigation before the Court of Justice. I want also to say that in many instances, legal mobilization is called as one of the tools by which we can empower individuals and empower actually even unprivileged parts, groups in our society, such as migrants. In my case, I would be very skeptical about this. As I said, migrants didn't really play a big role in the litigation. Without allies, without Euro experts, it would have been impossible for them to reach the Court of Justice. Many thanks uh, for your attention. Well, they say the hard cases make bad law, but apparently bad laws make landmark cases.
<laughs> Thank you very much. It was fascinating. So let's now end over to Mario, Mario Pagano, who is finalizing his PhD thesis here at the UI on environmental law under the supervision of Professor John Scott. His research seeks to describe how environmental NGOs are currently mobilizing courts inside and outside the EU to challenge the legality of EU measures and overcome the Plowman, the infamous Plowman test in actions for annulment. So in 2019, Mario joined the Court of Justice in the Archives Research Project, which I absolutely love, by the way, sponsored by the Academy of European Law, uh, the UI and Historic Archives of the EU. In the frame of this project, Mario had the chance to explore the original dossier of cement that case, uh, which he also presented at, uh, at the University of Naples, Federico II, in the context of a doctoral workshop. Uh, Mario holds an LM from um, the College of Europe, uh, Bruges, in European Union Law. Before joining EUI, he worked as a trainee at uh, DG ENV of the uh, European Commission in the Infringement Proceedings Unit. Mario, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Amedeo. <clears throat> Thank you for the, for the kind of introduction. And um, what, we have, what we have heard so far in these previous panels was about, um, was about trying to change and have an impact on national policies by using uh, EU law. And we saw that already with the presentation of Amedeo, but also now with the final presentation that Virginia just gave. But my presentation is more about something trying, trying to act at a different layer, which is when EU law in itself is not enough. And basically when civil society actors want to try to change and reorientate, as I argue, EU climate policy, in this case, through litigation. So when EU law is not enough in itself, um, in particular, EU climate law, uh, civil society actors, of course, deploy uh, different pathways. And in particular, today, I'm going to talk about direct actions. Therefore, the, um, the infamous uh, remedy established under Article 263 of the, tre of the treaties, Treaty on the Functioning. And today's presentation I, is going to be structured in three main points. So first, I'm going to describe the context, basically describe uh, briefly describe the global climate change litigation trend, what is going on at the global level, and in particular in Europe, in terms of climate change litigation, and then more specifically, analyze uh, a few cases that have been brought in the climate, uh, climate context before the Court of Justice of the European Union, and then provide the legal mobilization perspective on these cases. So let's start by analyzing this global climate change litigation trend. I'm sure that uh, all of you have heard about the um, infamous Urgenda, Urgenda, in Urgenda <laughs> told me, uh, uh, my Dutch friends, Urgenda case that was um, first decided in 2015. Uh, the first uh, ruling was decided in 2015, but the last one given by the Supreme Court of the Netherlands was given in uh, December 2019. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an important and relevant case because actually uh, it's inspired many, many NGOs uh, to dare more before, uh, before different courts inside and outside the European Union. But today I'm going to focus on European climate litigation. So after Urgenda, there were cases brought, for instance, in, uh, in uh, France. Uh, and all these cases that I'm going to describe, that I'm going to mention, are all successful cases. So, so of all cases where actually NGOs have won. So this case is is pretty recent, so it was decided in February 2021. Is is uh, was brought in France before the Conseil d'État, La Fer du Siècle, where actually Oxfam and Greenpeace uh, took part in in bringing this case, and uh, it was followed by uh, or some of them were anticipated or followed by other cases in, uh, in other jurisdictions of the EU. For instance, uh, one year uh, before, in, 20, in July 2020, uh, a similar case was also brought by friends of the Irish environment uh, before the Irish jurisdictions in order to once again hold uh, the Irish government accountable for, uh, for climate change, for the negative impact of climate change in particular on human rights. And uh, another case that has been this recently decided is the, this one in Germany, where also the German Constitutional Court recently uh, com convicted basically the German state to uh, set more ambitious target with regard to the cuts of emissions uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and also in Italy, uh, so I don't know if you knew about it, but also in Italy, there is a, a pending judgment that is uh, that in, from a, for, for a case that has been recently 
recently uh, has, has been recently be brought, been brought uh, before uh, uh, the Tribunale Civile of Rome, so civil tribunal in Rome. Uh, it's called a Doomsday, so Giudizio Universale. So it's a very apocalyptic name. And once again, so even in Italy, we uh, we 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 should have our uh, our uh, climate uh, ruling. We don't know if successful or not. But uh, we uh, also in Italy, this is going to happen. And also, uh, in these cases are not only been brought before uh, against, uh, sorry, governments, but also against corporations. In particular, very recently, Shell, uh, the massive uh, oil corporation from the Netherlands, has also been convicted by um, by Dutch jurisdictions to cut their emissions by forty five percent compared. Uh, to 2019 levels, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's another win for the environmental movement, um, and all these cases, as I was saying, are particularly similar. Are similar because. Uh, they, um, we have uh, state, states whose trajectories, trajectories uh, of emissions uh, are not in line with international commitments. Uh, but at the same time, these cases, even though they address a common and global threat such as climate change, they still need to be adapted to the local uh, legal context. And the word context is particularly important for my present in, my, in, in the context, in the frame of my presentation. Uh, this since, um, and, and the context that I just provided is crucial, of course, also for understanding, for properly understanding climate, lit climate litigation before the Court of Justice of the EU. So I'm going to start by uh, this first case, uh, Carvalho. Oh, as you, as you might have noticed, all these cases are extremely, extremely recent. So uh, I, I apologize for uh, some incomplete uh, this, um, analysis of the cases, but this is something that is going on at the moment. So even understanding taking research of what is happening at the moment is not extremely easy, uh, but Carvalho is the first case that has been brought. It's really uh, modeled in a way on the on the on the basis of Urgenda, and here we have ten, ten families, thirty six individuals from seven different countries, uh, and five uh, of these countries of uh, EU countries. In addition, we have also one NGO who contributed to bring the case. And in the, the 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 person here that you see is actually Mr. Carvalho, so that's the, that's the guy, uh, and uh, it's really important also to see uh, the personification of cases uh, and how these cases basically are also based on an individual narrative that I'm gonna uh, reflect upon uh, later on during my presentation. So these plaintiffs are actually seeking the annulment. We're seeking the annulment of uh, the EU climate package. We're addressing, we're contesting three legislative acts, and uh, they were claiming that these acts were breaching general principles of EU environmental law and fundamental rights enshrined under the EU Charter. And uh, these uh, plaintiffs were basically asking the court to order the EU to cut uh, greenhouse gases emissions by 20, 2030 by at least 50 to uh, 60 percent compared to the 90s levels. Um, the, the the strong focus, and here I would like to, uh, to 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 highlight one point that is already interesting from a legal mobilization perspective. That all these uh, plaintiffs uh, in both cases that I'm going to talk about made publicly available the application files that they presented before the court. So this actually made also easier to uh, to to study and to deepen uh, the arguments that they deployed uh, before the, the Court of Justice. And already by reading the, the application file, we can notice a very strong focus on the admissibility. Why? Of course, because we as we as we know, Plowman is uh, the major barrier to be over overcome. Uh, to get access to justice before uh, the C CJEU and actually never worked. And even in a little spoiler alert, even, even in these cases didn't work. But it's interesting to notice how these plaintiffs uh, were trying to mobilize the court of justice uh, because of the existence of Plowman. So they were using the rights enshrined under the EU Charter. And this goes back to the individualization of the plaintiff. So using individuals and the rights bared by these individuals to, pro to show the differentiation of their legal sphere, or how they were differenti differentiated by all the other um, uh, 
citizens basically in the EU because Plumon requires a differentiation in the formula, how it's been established in 1963. Um, the, this is, for instance, an argument uh, that has been deployed by the plaintiffs precisely with regard to the admissibility. The effects of climate change and hence the violation of fundamental rights is, the, is distinctive and, and different for each individual. Uh, a farmer who is affected by drought is, not, is in a different position from a fisherman affected by a loss of sea ice. So this is how they were trying to show their differentiation from the other plaintiffs. Each of them were, each of the plaintiffs was actually showing how climate change was affecting his or her home position. Uh, given that the EU has not adhered to the ECHR, the CJEU is to be the sole arbiter of the reconciliation of EU measures and fundamental rights. So here actually the, the, the plaintiffs were also trying to build uh, a connection with the ECHR and therefore a person is individually concerned where, the, where the per, that person is affected in a fundamental right. So this is the, the main argument that was used by the plaintiffs in Carvalho to show that they were actually um, different, they were, they were actually individually concerned by the, um, the EU climate package. The second case I wanna talk about is Sabo that basically what they were decided by the CJEU in appeal uh, of, of one of the, a few a few months after the other one basically um, the in this case uh, regards um, is, is has been brought by five individuals and one NGO uh, these individuals are from five countries four of which from the EU and they were seeking the annulment of the inclusion of forest biomass as a renewable fuel in the renewable energy directive too. So the, the amended version of the renewable energy directive. And even in this case, they were claiming that the, 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 the measure at stake was breaching general principles of EU law and fundamental rights. Um, even here, of course, they wanted to show how their legal position was differentiated by the, the one of of, of the other citizens basically in the EU and how the, they, they were individually concerned by the contested EU measure. And what I found fascinating is the storytelling uh, uh, style that they were using in, this, uh, in, the, in the application file that they submitted, because basically even here, since we saw uh, there, were, there were individuals bringing the case, these individuals were people living around forests. Uh, people living around forests and therefore since the biomass fuel is uh, included includes also pellet therefore this pellet is produced by uh, uh, by cutting down trees and therefore those who could be more individually concerned by the affected measure are those living in the surroundings of forests and one of the arguments that, is, that has been deployed is this by describing the personal connection of the plaintiff with forest. And this is an example. Uh, the, he made the, the, one of the plaintiff made the choice to raise his family in a region where he can access the forest to which he has a deep personal connection. Um, the, they were relying also on the uh, recent uh, Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee findings on EU compliance with the Aarhus Convention. And, uh, and they were basically also showing how the preliminary reference procedure is absolutely in inadequate to uh, fill the gap, the access to justice gap at EU level. Um, what did the Court of Justice answer? Um, of course, the Court of Justice uh, highlighted the problem of causation because the Court of, the court of Justice basically said, uh, plaintiffs do not, do, not, do not have to show the link between the, between climate change and fundamental rights, but between the contested measure and the rights of the plaintiffs. And therefore the court claimed that uh, this was not been, had not been proven enough uh, sufficiently by the plaintiff and therefore causation was not established and the Plumman test was not met. Uh, and actually the court also pointed out that EU legislative acts are excluded from the scope of the Aarhus Convention because precisely this was one of the points raised with regard to the findings of the Aarhus Committee. So the plaintiffs were saying, the Aarhus, the Aarhus Committee told you that you're not respecting the Aarhus Convention and the court responded, yes, but EU legislative acts are outside the scope of the Aarhus Convention. Um, and and the, call, the court recalled the EU complete system or legal remedies and addressed the plaintiffs to seek relief before national courts. 
and therefore dismissed both cases. But, and this is an interesting point from an impact, uh, from, from, from the perspective of an impact of litigation in the environmental and climate field, that actually Carvalho still got what he wanted uh, by a legislative process, because actually a few months ago, uh, the, um, the, uh, the new climate law, uh, EU climate law has been approved, and the EU target is to reduce net greenhouse gases emissions by at least 55% by 2030. So by other pathways, by other means, actually what the plaintiffs were seeking through litigation was actually achieved by other, uh, by other um, uh, legal avenues, basically. And, and maybe actually this is something we cannot, I cannot at the moment demonstrate that, I've, that actually we was because of the case that contributed probably to bring pressure, but that's actually what happened. Uh, a legal mobilization perspective, and this is going to be the last step of my presentation. So why still against Plowman and actually who is still going against Plowman? As I said, we are mainly experiencing, uh, we are mainly uh, observing individuals in the climate cases brought before the court of justice, um, in individuals, mainly farmers, backed up by NGOs. Um, I actually had the opportunity to interview for my thesis uh, different uh, lawyers working on environmental and climate cases. So I might share, I will share some findings with you that actually also refer to these cases. Uh, first of all, um, there is a distinction to be made between in-house and external lawyers, because external lawyers are those representing actually plaintiffs before courts, but it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean that the legal strategy uh, or, or the, basically whether that case fits within the, a bigger picture, a bigger puzzle is because of a strategy deployed by the lawyer, the external, the external representative, or actually that come from in-house lawyers working for uh, NGOs in particular. And usually uh, the strategy is uh, conceived in, internally by in-house lawyers in legal units. Um, and another point, a crucial point is that NGOs are, are currently sharing expertise, but are not necessarily coordinated, coordinating cases. Um, uh, NGOs are, uh, are um, therefore cooperating in many different ways, uh, especially in the climate context. And, but actually also these cases, these two cases show that they were not really coordinated because the actually outcomes were quite similar, even though the objectives were quite different, because in one case was the exclusion of a technical point from the RED, and in the other case was to reduce um, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, and actually another point I wanted to make on who are these plaintiffs is that one of the representative, one of the, one of the lawyers representing Carvalho before the CJU is actually an academic that actually is publishing on, on the case and is contributing to disseminate on the case by, by trying to reach other platforms or other audiences by other means. And it's uh, interesting to notice that at the bottom of that uh, first page of that article, the, law, the lawyer academic um, put a disclaimer uh, saying, uh, I'm striving to adopt a neutral stance. So it, it's interesting to also notice that these Euro lawyers are directly uh, contributing this to disseminate on the cases they work on. Um, and another point from a legal mobilization perspective is why are these NGOs uh, mobilizing the court? So in the co climate context is, uh, is, uh, is evident to see that uh, climate change litigation is creating a momentum for NGOs. And therefore, the context in which the judicial function is being exercised by judges, also by the EU judges, uh, is, is changing. Uh, and this, regardless of the answers of the Court of Justice. And this is proven by the many cases that are being brought before national courts across Europe. But what NGOs thought also in these cases was that actually the, it was the right moment, as Amedeo was saying, you have to bring the right case at the right moment before the right judge. They were thinking that actually was the right moment to bring these kind of cases both before the court. And actually one of the lawyers that I interviewed is that is one of the lawyers working on uh, the Sabo case told me, we thought that the Autos Convention Committee findings had changed something. 
in a way, it changed the context in which the court could respond to these cases. But they assumed the answer, assumed wrongly uh, that, the, that this was the case. And actually, the court was ready to abandon uh, the Plowman test. And therefore, um, the goal is not only to uh, reorientate EU climate policy, but it also it is also in some cases, uh, uh, also at national level, to mobilize citizens. Uh, this is particularly true for Carvalho, not particularly true uh, for Sabo, but uh, you can also notice that by visiting the websites of these uh, of these uh, of these cases, because the websites are really pro-dissemination. They are full of social media content to, ready to be shared. They're really focusing on storytelling and individual narratives of plaintiffs. The stories of these plaintiffs are being told and uh, there are also the legal documents publicly available. So the communication strategies of these NGOs are somehow intertwined with the legal strategies of NGOs and they're mutually feeding, feeding each other. Um, how are they mobilizing the court? Um, uh, not only the best weapons available, but available, but all all, web, all, all weapons available. Um, so all arguments uh, are basically deployed, all possible arguments, and using also favorable precedents to to try to convince the court to change its orientation on Plowman. And the, these favorable favorable precedents are often the other climate cases that I described in the first part of the presentation. And, and the last point is about the role of fundamental rights that are somehow uh, used as a as universal language in uh, in all these cases to address a universal problem such as climate change. So this was the the the, the one of the um, uh, one of the one of the belief of these plaintiffs was that also the court of justice would have shared this fundamental rights language, but it ultimately uh, failed to do so. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I took too much time, but thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Mario. So, I, of course, I really agree with the idea of giving a face to the cases. Only Langdell could believe that law is its own uh, uh, amorphous entity that evolves by its own. So, so storytelling is absolutely essential. And it seems that uh, you're really following uh, uh, the guidelines of Jerome Frank as to what constitutes good legal education. So this idea of following the cases as they develop. But uh, enough for me, I'll now hand over to our two very distinguished discussants. Uh, first is Lisa Conant, who is professor of political science at the University of Denver, which is absolutely marvelous, especially because of the colors of the leaves. In, 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 in the fall, um, all right. And um, uh, she specializes in the politics of European legal integration, exploring the impact of judgments of European Court of Justice and European Courts of Human Rights, and the relationship between legal mobilization and human rights protection in, uh, in Europe. So uh, Lisa, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, so uh, these two papers are really interesting in the way they complement each other and intersect um, in addressing efforts by civil society organizations, NGOs, to mobilize two distinct legal avenues for litigation at the, in the EU, the direct actions and also national court references for preliminary rulings. Um, Mario's paper uh, explores, as you just heard, the reasons for the sort of thus far failure of the NGO climate change legal mobilization at the Court of Justice of the EU, uh, with the cases first going to the general court um, and then not going really anywhere further due to this longstanding doctrine of the European Court of Justice that makes it all but impossible for individual natural persons or the collective actors representing them, um, like environmental organizations, to be granted standing at EU courts when they're generally affected by EU measures and not individually targeted in a harmful way that does not affect many or all other people, um, which is a really um, kind of absurd standard um, that's been abandoned in a lot of places. So, um, so as the General Court and European Court of Justice decline efforts to challenge EU measures and uphold the restrictive plowman rule from 1963, Mario points out that the EU judges tell plaintiffs to use the decentralized mechanism to apply and enforce EU law, go to the national court, ask the judges there to apply EU law, or send a reference to the European Court of Justice for preliminary rulings. 
And Mario mentions that applicants are arguing that the preliminary reference and ruling procedure may not be sufficient to guarantee effective judicial protection. This is in section 4.3, um, right where the section starts that page. Um, but, but the paper at least did not discuss why this might be the case or Mario didn't discuss that in his comments according to the plaintiffs or more generally. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this is part of Mario's dissertation thesis. Um, so if you're revising this segment for publication as an article, a standalone article, um, or maybe it's a just, a, it would be a different section of your dissertation. I'd encourage you to expand that discussion and include a detailed set of the reasons, ideally some evidence, um, um, even if that might mean you have to cite existing literature, but some reasons why the preliminary reference ruling mechanism um, or national legal mobilization to convince national courts of their positions will not be sufficient to achieve the aims of the environmental activists seeking to combat climate change. Um, Virginia's paper provides examples um, of how and why that decentralized system of EU law enforcement can be inadequate for social movement goals in the case of migrant rights. And there's other published scholarship pointing out limitations in other settings, other countries. Um, most of that literature, I think like Virginia's paper, explains that civil society groups would only try to engage EU law through national courts if they prefer the EU approach over the prevailing approach in national law. Um, but it sounds like your case is like the inverse. There's movement in national law that it hasn't happened at the EU level. So, you know, she talked about how you would never go to the EU if it doesn't give you something better than what you get at home. And it sounds like in your case, you're actually seeing success in national courts pushing national governments to adopt stronger targets. So why would you go to the EU? Um, it's not better, it's got this horrible standing case um, where they're just gonna say you can't even come. Um, the primary challenge in the situation usually described with the inadequacies of the decentralized system of EU law application is um, applicants must convince national judges to interpret and apply EU law in a way that fits their agenda or convince the national judges to refer the dispute to the European Court of Justice in the hope that the ECJ will then interpret EU law in a manner that's favorable to the applicants, you know, and substantively. Um, and neither of those steps is automatically forthcoming, as Virginia points out in her detailed case studies of decentralized legal mobilization of EU law through national courts in Italy, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And this is where you have to correct me if I'm wrong, because you were really using this language of annulment. And we have someone from the Court of Justice, too. So I may be totally wrong on this. But um, I think there's an even more fundamental problem with the ECJ telling environmental organizations to use the decentralized mechanism to engage EU law in that national court references for ECJ preliminary rulings, I understand to be primarily a tool to enforce EU law against conflicting national law. I'm not aware that the ECJ has been receptive to the use of national court references to be a tool to challenge the validity of EU law itself. But you've talked about the commission telling people, trying to train judges for actions for annulment. Are you talking action for annulment of the EU law? Um, that's like, news somehow. Um, and maybe I'm just behind the times here. Um, Neo-functionalists from very early literature on the preliminary ruling procedure spoke about it as a one-way ratchet that can only promote EU law and further integration against competing national preferences. And maybe we can disagree about the extent to which that's been true in practice. Um, but I was not aware that the ECJ has started to seriously entertain notions that national judges and the parties in their cases are going to successfully overturn EU measures themselves and not just national failure to implement EU law or the failure to implement EU law in the correct way. Um, but climate change litigants seem to want to nullify EU measures as inadequate to protect fundamental rights. And I, I see in preliminary rulings, the ECJ does often interpret the meaning of secondary EU legal instruments like directives and regulations in an expansive way in order to achieve the higher aims in the treaties like the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but that's not the same thing as declaring an EU act, I guess, to be EU unconstitutional and then prescribing detailed policy targets like reduce your emissions as much to achieve the alternative. So set me straight if I'm confused um, about the reasons why references and preliminary rulings are not sufficient. Um, that, that it's just not spelled out in the current paper why they're not sufficient. And I, I would agree they're probably not sufficient. I just I want to. I wonder why the organizations thought that, and maybe why you think that too. Um, to me, the paper, the solution seems to be totally doctrinal. 
climate change litigation could be mobilized in the EU if the ECJ would just overturn that restrictive plowman rule. Um, it's not inconceivable, right? Domestic courts around the world often had very restrictive standing rules that they eventually liberalized. And this is now old, this is really old. Um, so maybe overdue for liberalization. But the other, a big question I have is to what extent has the Dutch government actually responded to that uh, Urkenda case? <laughs> I'm just gonna say that right. Has it started to reduce emissions to the extent demanded by the courts and all those other cases too? Um, because they don't win if they just get legislation. They win if they actually get emissions reduction. So I want to take it all the way to the practice level. Is this starting to matter? Um, because if it's just the court telling government what to do and government doesn't do it, or legislation telling people what to do and no one does it, I don't. We don't yet have a victory for those environmentalists and for the for the planet. Um, it's a bit harder for me to comment on Virginia's paper. It's a published article in the Common Market Law Review. It's more of a completed project um, where she probably already addressed all kinds of referee suggestions and questions. Um, I'm really happy to see that journal publishing that kind of, this kind of socio-legal scholarship. Um, and maybe I need to browse it more broadly, but most of what I've ever read there is really doctrinal. Um, but this paper to me is exactly the sort of research I tend to call for more of this. Um, when I'm writing review essays about um, the literature on um, EU judicial politics and or concluding sections on some of my work on some of these areas. She's tracing, Virginia's tracing the bottom up origins of European litigation. And she's really seeing and documenting the variable success that litigants achieve, which she's prodding prior scholars that often exaggerated the ease and the impact of mobilizing EU law to pursue political change. Um, which I really appreciate. Um, and she's upfront about the fact that she's examined three cases where some EU legal mo mobilization did occur rather than the cases of entirely failed mobilization. And I know it's always harder to search for that dog that does not bark, but I wonder whether you might be able to look at that a little bit, given the kinds of research you've done. Um, is it possible to seek out some of the same types of organizations and associations that were pursuing cases in Italy, the Netherlands and the UK, and then look at th those kinds of organizations, right? Probably exist in some other countries that have large migrant organizations, or I mean, large migrant populations, right? Like, you know, France, I think has altruistic organizations. Um, Sweden, I would imagine must, they have a large migrant population. Germany, I would imagine as, potential cases and I mean, maybe Denmark, maybe there's no altruistic organization there. I don't know, they have, they have migrants, um, but Sweden had a really low rate of references in your table. Um, and then Denmark was off the map, which is not terribly surprising. This is like wind, you cite wind at one point, she talks about how Swedish and Danish judges are very averse to sending references. Um, so I just wonder whether you might be able to do some of that, looking at the dogs that didn't bark by, by picking other countries with lots of migrants and perhaps that they have um, altruist organizations and interviewing those people. Did they try, did they think about an EU legal mobilization strategy? Um, did they try one? Did national judges not refer their cases? Um, or did they think the EU law wasn't amenable enough and that national rules actually were we're good enough already. Um, I'm just curious if for an area for pushing your research forward in the future, if that might be possible. And that's that's all I'll say. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, it's great uh, that um, the author of the theoretical framework for legal mobilization could take part personally in, in, in this conference, well, although uh, through Zoom. So we hope to meet you in person at some stage. So I'll now hand over uh, to um, uh, and, and yes, our second distinguished commentator, uh, Luca Prete, who will probably provide a more uh, practical perspective because he works as a referendaire, and as a referendaire at the European Court of Justice in the cabinet of Advocate General Nicolas Emiliou, and has worked for several years in the cabinet of Advocate General Michel, Michel Bobek. He's also a guest professor at the VUB in Brussels, a graduate from the College of Europe in Bruges. He's the author of several publications, including my favorite, a monograph on the infringement proceedings that was published in 2017. So Luca, you have the floor. Thanks Amadeo, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the very nice work. Um, so um, I've got two comments and two additional elements. Um, first of all, let me stress, since I work at the court, I'm really talking personal capacity and I'm only, um, saying what is what are my views not um 
by any means um, disclosing something that is discussed at the court uh, and of which I might be aware. So first um, reaction, Professor Conan say, say well, um, I didn't know that a preliminary ruling could be used to invalidate um, EU legislation. Well, that of course there are many cases, but there are some, there are actually very famous cases in the uh, Facebook Schrems case, um, the Court of Justice invalidated, following a private litigation in, the, in Ireland, the privacy shield. So actually an international agreement between the EU and, and the US on data protection. Uh, actually did it twice, the court. <laughs> they did a, the agreement again, and it was annulled again by the court. Another case is Digital Rights Ireland, in which uh, the Court of Justice uh, invalidated the data retention directive. So yes, it is possible. It doesn't happen very often, of course, uh, as in any country, I am not aware of any country where the constitutional court suddenly invalidates over and over legislation uh, because private citizens go to court. I mean, in an ideal world, sure, we would all like to be able to go to court and challenge everything we don't like, but acciones populares, they do not exist in most legal systems, and I would say for a good reason. Sorry to be the, the one bringing orthodoxy and uh, conservatism. Um, the second um, reaction, and it's going to be brutal, is the reaction, oh, oh, let's hope the court will abandon Plowman. I'm intrigued, I'm absolutely intrigued to see that there are people thinking that Plowman could be overturned or just trying to get new arguments or new reasons why Plowman. Forget it. Just forget it. The right momentum came when Advocate General Jacobs, in a super beautiful opinion, argued why Plowman was wrong. And the court sitting in Grand Chamber said, no, Plowman is written in the treaty. That's end of story. What happened then? That the constitutional legislature, thinking that Plowman was too restrictive, amended the treaty. So with the Treaty of Lisbon, we have a third scenario in which private applicants can challenge EU legislation. So I might be wrong, but my idea is end of story. Dear academics, focus on something else. This is not something that is going to lead you anywhere. But now let me add a note of optimism. Plowman is what? Plowman is a formula which refers to certain criteria. Now, these criteria, of course, they can be modulated. Of course, they can be interpreted differently and they can be filled differently. And the precise content of these criteria, there is where I would say you should focus your research and your discussion because these are empty, yeah, empty criteria really. Um, so, and, and let me, um, and now I, I move on to the, less destructive and more constructive part of my intervention. Uh, an element, something that didn't come up in the discussion so far, although for uh, working related reasons, I only attended the last panel, you discussed a lot about NGOs or lawyers that act pro bono, act, um, well, because they have ideas and want to improve the world. Uh, but an NGO, an association, always is bound to represent a specific group of people. There are entities that represent, at least in theory, everyone because they are democratically elected. I'm talking about infra-territorialities, towns, regions, land, provinces, whatever. Why am I raising this? Because of course, when we distinguish between privileged applicants, eh, privileged applicants, Applicants are those that can challenge all measures of EU law, right? As long as they are legally binding. And non-private applicants, which is everyone else. Now, in this everyone else are private citizens, like Mr. Eldridi. There are NGOs, there are associations, there are companies, but there are also and, um, territorial entities. And there, in a number of recent cases, the problem arose on how to assess the Plowman criteria with regard to these collective 
um, territorialities to these um, infranational entities. And there, um, I think, well, we have to see what the court does because one case is pending. There was a first case, which I think it's very interesting because it, it, it concerns um, one subject that was discussed widely in this conference, environment. I'm talking about the case Région de Bruxelles Capital. What happened there was that um, the region of Wallonia, which a constitutional level in Belgium has the power to regulate pesticides, the region of Wallonia considered that the evaluation of, um, of the substance glyphosate was wrongly done by the commission and wanted to challenge it. So it went before the general court, but the general court said, well, use this magic Plowman formula and said, you are not directly individually concerned, go away. The region of Wallonia formed an appeal. So they challenged before the court. And there, I think it was very interesting, the dialectics, the dialogue that took place in front of the court. Because if you read the opinion from, um, from Advocate General Bobek, he thought that the general court errored probably five or six times. He found five, six error in that and said, no, the region of Wallonia should have been empowered to challenge it because at constitutional level, it has sovereign powers to decide on pesticides. They intervene at EU level, they should challenge it. Unfortunately, the court in a very slim judgment threw it out and decided, no, they are not individually and, and, and directly concerned. Um, explanation, not very much. But now there is a second case, which is interesting. And we go back to emissions. It's one of the many cases which stems from the diesel gate. What happens is that um, when suddenly it became apparent that the number of car manufacturers were placing illegal devices, um, the commission intervened and changed the legislation in order to alter, to amend the way these gas emissions uh, checkups were made. But in doing that, it adopted a coefficient that would basically affect the quantity of these uh, emissions that were recorded. The commission argued this was necessary because these were new methods. And depending on how you do the test, you get different results. So the commission said, we need to, at least at the beginning, use certain coefficients. Now, the towns of Paris, Brussels, and Madrid thought that this was basically cheating and said, look, you commission, you cannot do that because the limits, they're in a council regulation and by an implementing act, you cannot affect that. That's what you are doing. So they went before the general court and they won. The general court decided these three towns, they are individually and directly concerned because if the, if the commission basically intervenes and alters the emissions, these towns will become extremely hard for them to meet all the parameters. They will make their, their life, their job impossible because they will not be able to basically limit traffic to less polluting vehicles because the less polluting vehicles, they are not less polluting. They are very polluting and no one knows how polluting they are because all the data are fake. Of course, the commission went on appeal and now the appeal is currently pending. Another problem that arose here before going on to the substance of the case is, are the towns of Madrid, Paris and Brussels entitled to challenge this measure? Are they individually concerned? Are they directly concerned? Advocate General Bobek recalled this opinion of Bruxelles Capital and said, I think they are, they should be able to challenge it. And then there are a number of considerations regarding how this in the also uh, in a democratic uh, organization based on rule of law should be feasible if these infra if these uh, entities have got powers and national level in that field the case is fund is pending so um we are awaiting for the judgment of the court i think it would be very important because that's another way of mobilization that's another way you get to check eu uh, legislation through collective uh, to towns, through regions, land, whatever. 
Now, let me complete with the last element. The second element, um, which is also connects to this, is again on this complete system of remedies. So what the court has always said is essentially, if you are a problem of interpretation of EU law, you must be able to end up at a certain moment before the court of justice, the supreme interpreter of EU law. So either you do it through direct action, we just talked about that, so by challenging the EU measure, or you go through the preliminary ruling procedure, which was discussed earlier. Um, one point which we like to make is that, of course, this must be communicating vessels. And it's true that was said Valeria Passalacqua that so far the court gave the impression that he much preferred the preliminary ruling procedure. An example is, is, is just to complete my, um, this review of recent case law, some of you may know the, the case Blaze. Now in Blaze, what happened is that a number of citizens or, or uh, protesters, they went into a shop they were selling glyphosate, glyphosate, and they destroyed it. So, of course, they were they went under, um, they were investigated. They were subject to criminal proceedings, and the national court asked, "Oh, they are being prosecuted because they destroyed part of their property." By the way, they consider the glyphosate, glyphosate um, is wrongly put on the market. They shouldn't be put on the market because it's dangerous. Court of Justice, can you check whether it's the validity? of this regulation allowing glyphosate. Now, most of the people would have thought this is inadmissible. How does it change whether it was dangerous, not dangerous product? You cannot go into a shop and destroy private property. Surprisingly, the court was very short on this point and went very quickly to the substance and assessed the validity and confirmed it. And this is a strange, makes it rather stark contrast with the case I mentioned before where the region of Wallonia had serious doubts about the, the, the validity of that, went with, to the Court of Justice, and the Court of Justice said, no, go back home, go away, I don't want to look at it, you are not entitled. So one looks at the two and says, isn't there something odd that something should arrive to the court in the blessed manner, but not in the Région de Bruxelles Capital? Um, and there is an, a last element on that. And I think that these a fortiori all the more should be rethought if you now consider that the general court was uh, through the, in, the, in the last reform of judicial architecture was doubled the number of justices. Now the court basically is handling mainly because of the large number of, of preliminary rulings, the same number of cases of the general court with the general court being composed of the double number of judges. So perhaps in this distribution of workload, uh, there is something odd. And I would not be surprised if at the end of the day, instead of large theories about Plowman, et cetera, the court might not loosen it uh, merely for practical purposes. That might be said, but perhaps, uh, Perhaps that's what will happen. And I will stop here. And sorry for being blunt. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was exactly what I was looking for uh, because we, uh, academia needs an important reality check. And uh, indeed, there can be no uh, discourse on uh, this tragic use of litigation before the court of justice without the point of view of someone uh, even with not speaking, uh, speaking extra curiously, but that has a, a deep knowledge of the workings of the, of the court of justice. So um, before um, handing over to the two panelists, I'll just, um, uh, I'll just read the question that uh, we received from Tom Pavone, uh, uh, that is for Virginia. So um, uh, do you see an emergent cross-national network of public interest law firms serving migrant rights perhaps the beginning of what Charles Epp would call a litigation support structure? Or does this remain a balkanized and unorganized process of legal mobilization, primarily hinging on the personal initiative of a few altruistic lawyers or a few NGOs? So let's start from Virginia. Okay, many, many thanks for, uh, for the comments and, and the question. I will try to be brief because I see that it, it's really quite late um, and we'll address the, the direct question. Maybe um, first, sorry, Lisa, for just sending the paper. It's just a, 
uh, a part of a book project that I'm presenting. So that's why your comments are actually very, very useful for me because I, I, I am developing so a larger project based on that. Um, so I will start by your question about non-mobilization. Thanks a lot. You gave me already some idea. This is something I'm, I'm, I really want to explore. This is a thing that crucial part really of, of when asking. So I, I trace down when legal mobilization happens, but maybe the most important question is when it does not happen. So we, when we have these gaps, because probably in the field of migrants, at least they do reflect a gap in protection as well of, of individual rights. So that's a very serious question. Uh, one way in which I'm investigating it is already by comparing these three cases. So we saw, I saw in these three cases that we have resources, we have lawyers, we have allies and Euro lawyers, experts. Why do they focus just on this question and not on the other? And this is already a start to investigate when do we, don't, we don't have indeed this legal mobilization. Because as I said, for instance, in Italy, there were so many references on the return directives, but there have been no references on the um, family reunification directive, no references on the rights of third country national parts and of union citizens. So already there we see a lack of, of legal mobilization. So that's, that's a starting point. But I will look um, at the direction you indicated. Thanks so much for that. That's really, really useful. Um, then I also just want to do like a super small note on what you said about the common market law review. No, they didn't start to publish social legal research, unfortunately. I was talking to other colleagues. It's extremely difficult to publish in this kind of traditional, I think, well, okay, maybe I'm not in the best position to say that, but I, I encountered some reluctance by the editors. They were skeptical themselves about publishing my work and they said that they overcome it as an exception. So no, they didn't change the policy and it's still extremely difficult to find a space for social legal research in, in the European law field. So I, I would call for, yeah or a change in that direction. Um, then the question from Tommaso, many thanks. This is a great question. I would be very, very interesting indeed the, to, to know more about the American case because it's difficult by focusing just on, on the European context to understand whether our situation is, is, is like ordinary or whether it has something exceptional. In my experience, some of the uh, most striking fact that I found, so when I, when I started to understand that there was a legal mobilization for migrants before the Court of Justice, I was expected transnational actors, international NGOs being there. They were not there. It was a very national focus, mobilization by national actors. So it is a, extremely nationalized as a field. Uh, part of the reason why this is the case, it's because it is in the nature of the claims that have been brought. As I said, there were um, claims aimed to challenge national law. So they had a very uh, strong focus on national law. So that's why the lawyers, the, the organization were nationally um, embedded. However, there is also something true in what you say. So in Europe, we do have a problem of legal representation of the public interest, I would say. Uh, a lot of, of lawyers willing to, to work for the public interest lack fund, fundings. We do have also a problem of legal aid. I was uh, studying the case of the UK. The situation in the UK is dramatic at the moment because they did uh, cut the legal aid um, in in an unprecedented way in 2012, a lot of NGOs had to, I mean, legal um, uh, NGOs had to close down because of this reason. And that means that we do not have just a problem of legal representation for the public interest, but we really have a problem of access to justice for migrants because they do not have a decent representation. So in Europe, we do have a problem in, in that sense, for sure. Another, um, evidence that we do have a problem is the fact that through my database, I could see that in the 15% of cases, migrants are just not represented before the court of justice. So they have nobody that files written or oral observation for them. 15% of cases is a huge number, is more than one out of 10 cases. And this never happens for the member state governments, their counterparty, because they do file observation, oral and written observations in all the cases. So we do have an imbalance also in that sense. I will stop here and thanks very much for the question and, and the discussion. Thank you very much, Virginia. I'll now hand over to Mario. 
Thank you. Thank you very much to Lisa and uh, Luca for their comments. Uh, I'm going to try to be very brief because then we have the closing part. So, um, Lisa, regarding your, your question on the preliminary reference procedure, I apologize for not including a more comprehensive explanation on why the, the, the procedure established under Article 267 is not enough, is not adequate for NGOs, but that's because I have a separate chapter in my thesis on the preliminary reference procedure. Therefore, I didn't include, and also because I didn't want you to read too many pages. So I also did it in the, to facilitate your work in a way. So, um, so I have a specific part just addressing the preliminary reference procedure, but I can just summarize that basically NGOs um, share, the, share the view of, of Advocate General Jacobs in uh, Diego Queré and uh, Union de Pequeños Agricultores and raising all those reasons why the uh, preliminary reference procedure is not enough. Um, and actually some of the reasons were also mentioned by Virginia because for instance, uh, national courts uh, are those formulating the questions to be referred to the Court of Justice. So the the main characters are often not the plaintiffs, but actually the courts formulating questions. But there is also there are also other reasons, like for instance, EU law background, EU law knowledge, as Monica Glavina highlighted in her research as well. So there are also um, other factors uh, that are not necessarily structural or not necessarily legal, but still affect the likeliness of re references to happen. Um, and uh, regarding, um, and actually uh, regarding the uh, my point, my uh, my claim uh, with regard to the NGOs claim, is that basically I uh, think that NG my claim is that NGOs, even though they believe that is not adequate, the preliminary efforts procedure is not adequate. This is not a good excuse not to use it. So not to tr to to try to mobilize more national courts to seek. Validity references, as Luca Preta was actually referring to, in the as happened in the in the Blaze case. Uh, so I think that actually uh, NGOs should deploy all the weapons available in their toolkit, basically, uh, if they are serious about contesting the, the validity legality of EU measures. Um, regarding um, uh, the reaction to to Urgenda after the the ruling, actually the Netherlands uh, reduced by twenty four point five percent. Uh, by 2020, they got greenhouse gases emissions, and and the and the objective was 25 percent. And because of this 0.5 difference, actually, the one of the lawyers of Urgenda, one of the um, yeah leaders of the of the NGO, said that they could sue the, the government again for breaching the former ruling of the of the court. So this is a bit the aftermath of the Urgenda so far. Um, Regarding the comments of Luca Prete, I think that there's been a mis uh, a misconception, uh, a misinterpretation of my research. I'm not trying to convince the Court of Justice to abandon Plowman. I'm studying NGOs legal mobilization strategies to try to get access to justice. So I'm studying legal social movements. I'm not trying to convince the court. For me, the Court of Justice uh, and the Plowman interpretation is a legal barrier that exists. And I consider as a fact, de facto, as a factual barrier that is there. I don't have to convince the court to, to abandon, abandon the test because many other scholars have already done that. What I find interesting is to analyze the, the legal mobilization strategies and the non-legal strategies deployed by NGOs to achieve societal change in the climate context. And this is something that is going on. Many NGOs are mobilizing, not only the Court of Justice, as many, but many other courts, as I was uh, trying to argue in my presentation. And these, uh, according to NGOs, should also affect the Court of Justice. Then whether the Court of Justice is responsive in an affirmative way or not, it's, uh, it's uh, for other research to, to deal with that. I'm focusing on analyzing social movements. And um, regarding um, uh, your point on the Bruxelles, uh, Région de Bruxelles Capital and, uh, and uh, the, Ville de uh, the Ville de Bruxelles, Madrid and Paris opinions, I completely agree with you that this could be very interesting new potential uh, avenues for, uh, for legal mobilization. Uh, and I found that the, the opinions, and in one case, the ruling extremely fascinating and interesting, even though in the, as you pointed out in the Ville de Bruxelles, the main point was about the, right, the direct concern rather than the individual concern that is usually at stake in, uh, uh, in environmental uh, and climate cases. So, and, it, and they're not actually the same 
kind of concern, not actually the same kind of requirement. The, 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 formula, the formulas are different and uh, it's been a problem to get, to, to get a knowledge direct concern even in, in environmental cases by NGOs. So even the direct concern is still a problem for NGOs, but I agree with you that uh, seeking other actors mobilizing the court in the environmental context can be a new, uh, a new pathway that could be pursued. And uh, regarding the BLESS case, I actually don't agree with you on the, uh, on the feasibility of these uh, validity references, even in the environmental context, because precisely BLESS shows that uh, after the admissibility phase, there is the judicial review. And the intensity of the judicial review in, uh, in cases uh, um, dealing with precautionary measures, as it was in the Blaze case with glyphosate, uh, proved that, proven that the manifest error uh, of appraisal, the manifest error of appreciation of, uh, European, uh, of um, committed by European authorities is a very loosened test that doesn't allow for an intense judicial review. And, and many precautionary measures have been saved in a way or declared valid by the court precisely because of this, of this test. Uh, this doesn't mean that the court is wrong, of course. I'm just talking, as, as I was saying, as a serious, I, I pretend to be a serious observer of what NGOs are trying to, are trying to do. Uh, and, and this is one of the main major obstacles they find in the references on validity. So after the admissibility, there is the, uh, the in judicial review that according to them is not intense enough. I hope that answers your question. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mario. And uh, I see that there are no other questions. I think it's perfect time to introduce uh, the final remarks uh, by Alberto Alemanno. And uh, he is a Jean Monnet professor in of European Union law uh, and policy at HEC in Paris and serves advisor for the Florence School of Regulation here at the UI. Um, he has pioneered innovative forms of academic and civic engagement and activism in EU transnational space via his civic startup, The Good Lobby. Is qualified as an attorney of law in New York and has also been on the other side. Uh, so he is also clerked at the European Court of Justice. He has worked extensively with policymakers, funders, advocacy groups, as well as progressive companies in developing strategies and novel approaches to questions of democracy, political inequality, and corporate political behavior. So, Alberto, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amedeo. Can you just tell me if you hear me well? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you for the kind invitation and uh, bravo. Uh, bravo, Virginia, Amedeo and Mario for, for putting this important event today together and, and bringing us here um, as, as a community to, to discuss those important insights coming from your research. Um, bravo to all the paper givers and, and thank you also to the discussants for pushing the conversation further. I have the pleasure to follow the entire event here from my desk while taking notes. And I think there is a sense, which is probably a shared sense, that today's event by refining the theoretical and methodological uh, foundation underpinning this reflexive approach to European law may signal the coming of age of this field. A well-identified community is emerging uh, with compelling insights uh, that are potentially capable to change the way we look at the European factory of law. Uh, you are making observable phenomena that have not been visible for a long time um, in terms of actors, in terms of power dynamics. But these phenomena, in reality, uh, have existed for a long time. We just couldn't see them uh, because they were not necessarily covered in our uh, standard accounts. In other words, your work is forcing us to identify some uncomfortable truths uh, generally hidden uh, in the EU law textbook. I don't have a research project uh, to present today, but a broader professional and, and personal commitment to the democratization of, of the European Union, an endeavor that I've been pursuing by structurally improving uh, the access to the European institutions, including the courts, uh, for a broader community of actors uh, who are generally excluded uh, to access to the European institutions. So I will be building on this experience uh, by knowing that it's not scientific in nature, but it has been punctuated by some scientific publications focusing on issues ranging from access to justice to openness 
uh, that somehow offer an underpinning for some of the reflections of today. Uh, as you have anticipated, I've been involved in a variety of rather unconventional initiatives at the interface between academia and public interest work, the European Public Interest Clinic, now led by Lamine Kadar with NYU and pursued also in my own university, and then the Good Lobby, which has somehow expanded our outreach uh, by, legal, by mobilizing legally uh, hundreds of actors in campaigns, administrative and also judicial litigation over the last decade. As such, uh, by borrowing Tommaso's words, I definitely belong uh, to those pushing for a third way, a third wave of euro lawyering, broadly defined, striving to act on the root causes of what prevents legal mobilization to further drive European integration. In other words, my working assumption, possibly my credo, is that greater mobilization would have given us a stronger, more resilient Europe, one that would not be under a permanent constitutional threat by a handful of countries today. So against this backdrop, I would like to share a few reflections with no ambition to be exhaustive on what has been discussed today, but rather a few ideas, possibly provocations that might help us to further uh, advance our conversation. So given the current state of the European legal order, and in particular its constitutional crisis, I think to look into EU law through an historically and sociologically informed lens is something we need to do more often uh, and in a more a structured way. I think this approach to the study of European law is not only a nice academically entertaining exercise, as many of you, of many of us thought a few years ago when Morten or Antoine start working on unpacking those cases, but it's really this kind of work that carries a major explanatory power uh, by challenging conventional wisdom and in particular the standard account of how law contributed to European integration. And as such is also set to raise some inconvenient truths. And if I have to put together in a provocative way what I've been hearing today, um, legal the legal mobilization story is a story of entrepreneurial lawyership. It is a story of legal illiteracy by many national courts when it comes to European law. It's a story of commodification of euro lawyering uh, that has been rewarding the wealthy to the expenses of civil society interest in a pretty incestuous community of the few, not the many. But at the same time, it's also a story of a public interest movement, at least in Central European countries, supported by US philanthropies to the benefit of many NGOs but also the product of the engagement of the pro bono movement all across the continent. There is little doubt, and I hope that you agree with me, that this account of European law is much more interesting and possibly much more accurate than the account we have been hearing and somehow uh, sharing with hundreds of students over, over the years. Each of you, uh, with your scholarship, is not only advancing the field, but is also improving our individual and collective understanding of European integration and possibly hinting to some way forward. And I think this is the most important component of the work we are doing today, learning from the past. The second point I would like to make is that your presentation demonstrated not only that the European legal order as we know it is the product of legal mobilization, but also that legal mobilization today is alive and kicking. And this is a prom promising news uh, given the state of integration and the difficulty of policy making alone to advance uh, our attempt uh, to address major pan-European challenges and therefore legal mobilization represent an extra tool uh, for making such a progress happen. However, there are a few empirical question marks uh, which I think are key uh, to be raised. I know that some of you try to address them uh, with granular data uh, in, in some instances, but let me tell you that I still don't know, uh, as uh, not an insider, how much legal mobilization exists today. In other words, when compared with conventional litigation, uh, what's the percentage of court cases that qualify as the product of legal mobilization? If, if we look at this diachronically, do we witness more mobilization today or in the early days of integration? How does Euro the European legal order scores 
when compared with other jurisdictions in terms of legal mobilization? Do we have more or less uh, than, for instance, what occur at the national level? In other words, what is the size of this phenomenon? W what is the impact? How can we measure the impact of legal mobilization? What kind of proxies should we identify? It is the number of legal mobilized cases registered in front of the court. Uh, it is the outcome of those cases, or can we identify some other elements telling us whether this legal mobilization has been successful? In other words, where should we look at when talking about the impact of, of legal mobilization? And the final question, which I find much more interesting uh, for the future is, what actually stops legal mobilization uh, to become more prominent today? And on this point, let me also be uh, as uh, bold uh, as, as Luca, um, as, a, as a practitioner. Uh, Luca has been telling you the perspective of the court, and I take the liberty to tell you a little bit what I see in civil society organizations after almost 10 years of daily engagement with them. Legal mobilization is not yet part of the advocacy toolbox of the ordinary NGO. Not even the most professionalized Brussels-based organization with more than 1 million euros budget do consider to litigate. Going to court is a course of action that is culturally perceived as very far away from DNA, uh, not only at the national and local level, even more when it comes to the European Union. Um, I would say there are structural reasons for this. Uh, lack of access to justice due to the standing rules. We had a, a very interesting and informative conversation um, between Mario and, and Luca and the different participants. We have a lack of amicus curiae brief. That means that NGOs and nonprofits do not have an alternative low cost approach to court cases affecting them, where they also have some representative claims. There's no chance for them. There's something even worse. There is a chill effect due to the limited knowledge and unfavorable rules governing judicial costs. How those costs are gonna affect the desire of a brave NGO to actually try to uh, file a case before the court. And then there is a lack of professionalization of the NGOs, both in advocacy and in legal matters, which are in turn driven by funding dynamics. Um, the public and the philanthropic supports uh, have been disincentivizing legal mobilization. They haven't really created the opportunity structure for the nonprofit organization to hire in-house lawyers, in-house uh, academics, able to actually provide this expansion of their, of their toolbox. It is against this backdrop that I think the practice of legal mobilization seem stuck today in a paradigm in which either it takes place out of idealism of a few unconventional actors, be they academics or lawyers, or out of a neo-corporativistic push as a result of big philanthropy or big pro bono cherry picking a few battles. We can't let legal mobilization be driven by this paradigm or it won't survive. My claim today is that legal mobilization needs a makeover. It is time to move beyond thinking of heroic individuals a la Gian Galeazzo Stendardi as a singular agents of social and political change via, via legal mobilization. Rather, we need to tackle the root causes preventing legal mobilization to scale. And we have to do this one by one. We had a great conversation about access to justice. I believe, and I've been saying this even when I was at the court for over five years, that only if we experiment more by bringing more cases, we're gonna create the opportunity for the courts, notably the general court, to expand his horizon and to realize that there is a case for reviewing his own locus standing, and in particular, his understanding of Article 263, Paragraph 4. When it comes to amicus curia brief, I belong to those who argue that by reading uh, several provisions of the treaties combined with the rules of procedure, it is actually possible to build a judicial participatory culture enabling the jure condito, the court of justice to be much more open to the idea of engaging with outside input. 
There is an argument to be made that I had the pleasure to make to President Kuhl Lennertz only last week, that in this historical time, unless the Court of Justice will expand its legitimacy base beyond the parties to the case, he won't be able to keep his own legitimacy and therefore credibility in the way in which he delivered justice. There's another important component, which is somehow overlooked, I think, in our conversation today, but we can always remedy. There are few people working on third-party litigation, meaning alternative way of funding uh, cases that can also be brought to the court of justice. If we take this right, if we get this right, this could be a game changer in amplifying the opportunity structure for experimentation in front of the court of justice, which could in turn advance the case law of the court of justice when it comes to access to justice. All these reforms come with a call for an expansion of the very concept of legal mobilization. We need to include into this all sorts of participatory judicial activities that the court may undertake in the near future. Uh, let's remember that since 2009, the Court of Justice is subject like any other European institutions to the principle of openness, Article 15 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. This provision refers to the obligation of all the institutions to work as openly as possible. Unfortunately, being the ultimate judge of its own openness, the Court of Justice has never been taking this provision very seriously. But at the same time, very few actors have tried through litigation or through administrative actions to push the Court of Justice to define when the court is acting as a court administration and when the court is acting as a court jurisdiction. If the court acts as a court administration, in my view, for instance, when it organizes a, a hearing, a judicial hearing, well, in that case, it's subject to the full principle of openness. And therefore, he has to open up uh, not only its gates, but he has to allow virtually anyone to actually follow what is happening, what is occurring. If I take an example, the public hearing, the hearings of the Court of Justice are public. This is written in a variety of provisions, which together clearly suggest that the hearing should be open as a general rule. However, you need to take a trip to Brussels, to, sorry, you need to take a, a trip to Luxembourg in order to be able to witness the information which is exchanged between the parties and the court and the information that might gather. If you're a wealthy individual, you can also subscribe to a paid service by MLEX and others companies offering this service to you. But this is obviously not the best way to give access uh, to the information shaping the legal reasoning and the factual reconstruction of a particular case by the Court of Justice. Let me conclude by saying that uh, the study of legal mobilization today offers a meaningful contribution to a broader effort at expanding our understanding of the role that the Court of Justice play in European integration and in our society as a whole. I hope that my call today, slightly militant, slightly uh, provocative, uh, really try to rejuvenate the practice of legal mobilization that you have been reconstructing so uh, perfectly over the years. There's so much to learn from this practice, but I think we have a moral duty as legal scholars to try to scale this up and to basically find a way uh, to generalize those approaches and find structural support uh, for enabling many more of these dynamics to take place today. This is a matter of defending the European integration process from many rebellious actors who apparently at the moment are not really willing uh, to give up on their attack on the court. At the very same time, these actors do disqualify the primacy of European law and the legitimacy of the Court of Justice. They are using the court in order to challenge uh, those provisions, those regulations they don't like. This is what is happening in Luxembourg today and tomorrow in a very important case, possibly the most important case of the year in which Poland and Hungary have challenged the validity of the regulation on the conditionality of the rule of law. It offers a fantastic case study for legal mobilization happening by those two particular countries uh, in this historical moment. 
thank you so much for your attention and happy to engage with you if there's still time later on. Thank you very much, Alberto. Well, and I think uh, this perfectly concludes our conference. Uh, indeed, uh, we have examined the origins, development, and perspective of legal mobilization, the past, present. And so thanks to uh, Alberto for providing some food for thought as to the future of legal mobilization. So I'd like to thank again all, the, uh, all, the, uh, all our panelists, all our, our distinguished discussants, um, all the participants, both on premise and online, and of course our host, the Gasperi Institute for, for hosting this conference. And uh, let me just uh, close with, um, by paraphrasing a quote from the 1890 French edition of Rubens Foyering, La Lutte pour le droit, qui défend son droit, défend le droit européen tout entier. Thank you very much. <laughs>